Annyeonghaseyo! I'm Minzi from Seoul. Do you believe conspiracy theories are real? Because I do. Before I tell you my paranormal story, please like and subscribe. Nothing much to say about myself. I'm timid, introverted, but above all, I have a big ambition to webtoon horror category. Ahem! It's one of a kind, right? I've spent sleepless nights on that. Go kneel in the hallway for 30 minutes. Now! Aw, oh, man. Creepy Mincy is at it again. She wants to haunt the whole class with those ugly doodles or something? Ugly? Well, not as ugly as your... your grandmother. The whole class gasped at my insensitive words. But it's that girl. Supin's fault first. No matter how invested I was into my draft, it only ended up another chance for Supin and her posse to laugh at me. And well, thanks to my poor communication skills, no one wants to be my friend. Well, except Hajun, my childhood friend. He's always been so nice to me. Not to mention he's handsome, friendly, and smart. You could tell I had a crush on him, right? But of course, I have no guts to tell him. <sighs> One day I was riding my bike around when I suddenly saw flyers from Blackwood Publishing, the biggest publisher on Webtoon. They're looking for a comic collaborator. Oh, wow. I could send mine to them. But would I stand a chance? I bet the candidates are way more talented than me. As, I guess I better stop dreaming. Just then a skater kid dashed towards me. I managed to dodge him, but ended up crashing onto the pavement fence. I felt myself flip through the air and then everything went black. When I opened my eyes, I found myself on the hospital bed. Mom and Dad were beside me. They looked like they couldn't believe it, then burst into tears. Mincy, honey, you're finally awake. Thank God. You've been in a coma for the whole month. We were worried sick. Hold on a sec. A whole month in a coma? Was I that seriously injured? It took me a few days to recover and process all of this before going back to school. Bet these kids didn't even notice I was missing class for a month, though. But suddenly, someone sprung on my back. Supin? Oh, here you are, Urichingu! Let's go shopping today! The dress you picked me last time was perfect for my date! W what dress? Am I friends with these mean girls now? And not just them. Everyone else seemed to be friendly to me all of a sudden. They gave me cookies, carried my food tray, and even lent me their notebooks. It's weird, but kind of nice, though. <laughs> Except the only person I cared about just straight up ignored me. Hey, Hajun, wait up. Are you all right? I'm fine. It's none of your concern anyway. Oh, I just want to check in on you. <sighs> Could today get any weirder? Yes, it did. When I came home, I suddenly received an email from Blackwood Publishing. Congratulations! Your digital comic is now officially published on our website. To celebrate your success, please come to our office tomorrow. Huh? Is this a prank? I quickly checked, and it's not. My comics were literally on the headliner. But how? I mustered all the courage and went to the publisher. One step in, and I was overwhelmed by all the facilities. It was all so new to me. But just then, a group of people flocked around me and babbled to me nonstop, like they'd known me before. Yeah, our faith boy group BOF, Boys Over Flowers, is holding a concert tonight. Those opas make my emo heartbeat like crazy. Hey, you should come with us. It's going to be so much fun. Eek! Oh, but didn't those boys only lip sync and dance half-heartedly? I even heard people say it's a waste of money going to their concert. Guys, did I say something wrong? Suddenly, I got this chill down my spine. Someone's hands were crawling around my waist. My boo-boo's here. Ah, pervert! I turned around and slapped him in the face. Oh, why did you do that? It's me who should ask this. Why did you touch me? Are you serious? Wait, are you still sulking with me? What? I'm sorry, okay? Now your boyfriend's ready for some snuggles. Boyfriend? Last time I checked, I still had the biggest crush on Hajun. How did I settle for this dandy? The guy was extremely clingy. He wouldn't leave me alone for a sec. Um, don't you have any work to do? Work? I am. I'm tending to the artwork of my life. You! <laughs> uh, sure. He also kept insisting on seeing my webtoon draft to help me polish it. Help my butt? He only messed it all up. Not to mention, everything is completely new to me, but everyone acted like I'm so used to all of this. This didn't feel right. Later the day I told my parents about this, and they said the doctor did mention possible memory loss due to brain injury. Hmm, makes sense. But why did they seem all anxious? Over the next few days, I tried to cope with my new life, even though it didn't make any sense at all. Like, I now had my favorite seat in the canteen. You nerds are sitting on Minzy's spot. Move! And apparently, I got a new hobby of skipping school now. 
What's the matter? You've done this so many times before. <laughs> Why did I even do this? Hajun, on the other hand, still kept distance from me. Until today, we had a project discussion. I tried to break the ice, but he only replied coldly. Why are you here? This whole month you've ditched me to hang out with your hot friends. And now you suddenly want to talk to me again? The, the whole month? What do you mean? You suddenly turned 180 degrees and became this attention seeker. You even pulled stupid pranks on those mean girls and got them to worship you as their leader. B but I was in a coma the whole month. <laughs> You're kidding, right? No. Why would I joke about something like that? Then who was the Mincy I saw every day at school the past month? Was he saying I was in two places at once? How was that possible? Hajun came up with a bunch of conspiracy theories, then concluded that I had an imposter, and she had been replacing me while I was in the hospital. It made perfect sense, but so bizarre at the same time. Seeing how freaked out I was, Hajun gently comforted me, saying he'd help me figure this out. I knew it. He still cared about me deep down. While we were discussing, Su Pin and her clique came interrupting us. Hey, Mincy! What are you doing with this geek? Remember our group meetup today with the Ansan Highs boys? Meet up? Uh, no, I don't think I can- Of course she remembers. Can I come too? I'll keep my mouth zipped. Fine, now hurry up. Psst, what are you up to? Your imposters must have known about this meetup, so she might be there. This is our chance to catch her. Except the imposter was nowhere to be found, while I was stuck with these self-obsessed dudes. Where's your sass, Mincy? Introduce yourself. Oh, um, hi, uh, I'm Mincy. You can call me Sugar Mincy. Because I'm sweet as pie and you sure want to take a, a bite. The whole room was dead silence. <laughs> Girl, you got no riz. Wonder why you can't date anyone. Everyone was laughing at my face. Luckily, Hajun grabbed my hand and took me out of there. Here's much better. But I couldn't help but thinking how my life had turned upside down because of that imposter. You all right? You don't have to force yourself into a mold that isn't for you. You're special for who you are. And I prefer this you rather than that imposter. I could feel something churning in my stomach. I'm so glad I always have him by my side. The next morning, Su Pin and her clique suddenly came to apologize for laughing at me. But why? Uh, didn't you come back last night and snapped at us? Told us to publicly apologize to you today? I did? So the copycat did come to the karaoke. Did she intentionally stalk me? Later that day, I went to tell Hajun about this. But why did she have to do that? I mean, she tried to stand up for you, right? I don't know. It must be part of her scheme or something. I have to find her ASAP. Suddenly, I got the notification of the Mean Girls live streaming at a cafe. Wow, guess who it is, guys? Oh, our little rich lady is a waitress. And she dared to look down on us all the time. She steered her cam towards the poor girl they were talking about. And she looked exactly like me. It's her! Hajun and I immediately rushed to the cafe and saw Su Pin and the imposter was about to jump at each other. What's going on here? Mincy? Wh what? Why are there two Mincy's? It's a g g g ghost! Guys, run! You! Who are you? And why did you pretend to be me, you imposter? Mincy, finally we meet. I'm your twin sister. Minha! Sister? We're related? But mom and dad never told me I had a long lost sister. Because you're adopted. They didn't know you had a twin sister who just got adopted before you. You're lying. I'm not. I didn't know this either until my mom was in her final moments. Mom had been sick for a while. So one day she called me to her bed, told me the truth before she drew her last breath. After that, I came to find you, but you were already in the hospital by then. You did wake up after surgery, but once you saw me, you immediately had a seizure and fell back into a coma again. Your parents and I agreed it was best for you if I stayed away and waited until you fully recovered. Meanwhile, you decided to live my life for me? Believe it or not, I actually wanted to know what my long-lost twin sister's like. How she's doing? Turns out you're a very talented comic artist, but you're always so insecure. And you're not doing well with the kids at school either. So I wanted to help you out. Sending your webtoon draft, working at the publisher, and fixing those mean girls wagons. I just went with it and ended up getting too wrapped up. Really, did you get wrapped up in dating a random guy under my name too? And what about school? Did my parents agree to let you replace me? It was my idea and I persuaded them. They're just worried about you. I didn't ask for any of these in the first place. Thanks to you, I've become a stranger to my own life. You're happy now? Then I ran away, never wanting to see her again. Still, the worst part was, my parents lied to me. Why did you do it? 
You didn't tell me I'm adopted, and now you let a stranger replace me? Do you really see me as your child? Minty, honey, of course you're our daughter. Nothing could ever change that. We were afraid you'd be sad if you knew you were adopted. Truthfully, we love you more than you can ever imagine. It's a lot to process, but I had to be strong and stay focused. But soon, whisperings caught my ears. Did you notice Mincy recently is different and even a little bit dull? Where's the cheeky Mincy we're used to? Hey, do you get that bad vibe from Mincy lately? Somehow she'd gone back to being a sullen, creepy nerd again. God, why did everyone keep comparing me to that imposter? Hey, you all right? No, I'm not. Everyone seemed to like Minha and she'd only been here for a month. But nobody cared about me. I do care about you. You always got me. Your handsome friend, ready to the rescue. <laughs> Whatever you say. Come to think of it, your sister only meant well. Despite her way, all she wants is to help you to be more open and show your hidden talents to the world. What Hajun said got me thinking that night. Maybe he's right. If it hadn't been for her, my webtoon would have been forever locked in my iPad. Besides, she's only got me as a family. I've got to see her now. Hey, I came to apologize. I could see you only meant well. And I was only acting ungrateful. I'm sorry. And also, thank you, Uni. There's nothing to be sorry about. It's my fault too for acting on my own and getting myself to fall in love with Si Wu. I haven't told him yet, but I will find the chance. Sorry for dragging you into my stuff. I leapt into her embrace and felt the happy tears running down my cheeks. After the teary reunion, we spend hours catching up with each other. It's like we're reading each other's minds. Must be the twin bond. <laughs> I even invited her to my house and we had a good time. For the next couple days, I only focused on the webtoon and getting to know myself better. With Hajun's help, I now felt more comfortable and confident speaking with others. One day at the publisher, while I was having a little chit-chat break, a colleague rushed in. Minzi, Minzi, did you hear the news? Your webtoon won the first prize of comic award. Comic? The most renowned award in webtoon? Oh my god, I'm dreaming, right? My hard work finally bore fruits. I was celebrating with my colleague when out of nowhere, Si Wu dragged me out. You better announce me as the co-author. I helped you with the sketches, the script, the coloring, yada yada yada, remember? What? You were only messing it up. Do you even know what the story is about? Babe, don't challenge me. Or else, I would tell the director, aka my dad, to kick you out. And by the way, let's break up. Excuse me? You really think I like you? Oh, please. I only do it for your webtoon, babe. Grr, that dandy jerk. I knew he was no good. But what could I do now? Later, I told Minha everything, and she was heartbroken and begged me to help her sneak into Siwoo's office. So I did. Siwoo, please don't leave me. How could I live without you? Oh, it'll be hard, because I'm irresistible. <laughs> but you gotta let go, babe. You have nothing else to offer me. I already know you don't love me, but I do love you. And I already put a love spell on you. You'll forever be haunted by me. <laughs> then, Minha fainted, crashed on the floor. Scaredy cat Siwoo was freaking out. Hey, hey, you're not gone, right? Suddenly, the light turned off. What in the Holy Spirit's going on? The light turned on again, and the guy stopped screaming until he saw me. Hi, babe. Ah, what? Why are, what are you? You don't recognize me. It's me, Minji, in spirit form. Stay the heck away from me. After every despicable thing you've done to me. Please, please. Come with me, you crooked. To, to, where? To the other side. He was so scared his eyes went white. Then he fainted. <laughs> Serves you right. And let me introduce my Ekip with Minha, who should win Oscars for that performance, and Hajun, who's behind the light effect. Didn't think of that, did you? After that, Siwoo kept insisting I was some spiritual force that haunted this place. Then eventually, he quit the job. And of course, I had the full copyright of my webtoon and was eligible to receive the comic award. My career has just begun as I decided to continue to work at Blackwood. Mom and Dad also decided to adopt Minha into our family and we could finally be together. That's the magic I wanted to tell you. This unexpected event changed my life for the better. Chance doesn't come twice, right? You have to grasp it. By the way, I want to ask, do you guys have any unexpected events that changed your entire life? Tell us in the comments below. Hang on, here's one more thing I have to do for the old shy me. Hajun, uh, I've been wanting to tell you something. The past event got me thinking, 
If I don't start telling you how I feel now, I might regret it later. So, Kim Hajun, I like you. So, so much. Finally, it took you that long. When you were in hospital, you weren't the Minzi I knew, which freaked me out thinking what if I couldn't see the real you anymore. It's comforting that you're still here, cause I got a huge crush on you too. You are watching the incredible Barry's Blue. I'm Sonya, the super talented lead vocalist, and that guy over there rocking the guitar is Eric, my boyfriend. He's also our composer and backing vocalist. Yep, my man's good at everything, just like me. Actually, he's the one who discovered my vocal talent and helped me on my road to fame. Our debut album exploded onto the charts. And the rest is history. Eric asked me to be his girlfriend right on stage after our set. I don't know who was more excited, me or my adoring fans. Everything was perfect. And then our next album flopped. I guess all that pressure had interrupted Eric's writing process. I tried to send him positive energy. We had a big show coming up to debut our new single and start our comeback. Who knows when the sun will rise again, right? But during our performance, as Eric stepped back to give me the spotlight, I stepped forward and suddenly slipped and fell. S Sonia, your nose, it's crooked. I was rushed into surgery, but my nose looked like a lightning bolt. I can't look like this. I must be beautiful. You'll always be the cutest girl to me. No need to worry. We can still fix it. But right after that, the photo of my busted nose hit the headlines. I got ridiculed for praising natural beauty and then getting plastic surgery. What vultures! I had to upload the video of me slipping to end these rumors. But they claimed I did it on purpose to get attention. What on earth? We thought all that drama was finally over. But no, right when my nose healed, my chubby pre-puberty secondary school photo appeared all over the internet which sparked rumors about me having my whole body reconstructed. Some anonymous posts even made up that I was hot-tempered and snooty to band crew and waiting staff. I mean, maybe I could be a bit abrupt, but I was famous, so I was allowed to get what I wanted. Then, Let's Cancel Sonya began to circulate. Do these tragic people have nothing better to do than gossip about me? But my fans took notice, and a load of our tour tickets got cancelled. My manager freaked out and made me go on leave until the rumors died down. How ridiculous! Worse still, they were actually going to try to replace me? The beautiful, one-of-a-kind lead vocalist? How dare they do this to me? I am the band! Hang in there, babe. I promise I'll find a way to get you back. Obviously, my photos didn't leak themselves. Some jerk did this, and it's now my life mission to track them down and make them pay. Okay, so from my internet searching, I traced the original rumor to this group of my anti-fans. Can you believe they actually met up at this cafe once a month just to badmouth me? They even had a schedule. How ridiculous! What had I ever done to them? Disguising myself, I showed up to find out more clues. Hmm, inside were those terrible leaked pictures of me. Jeez, these people clearly had way too much time on their hands. Wait, this guy looks familiar. Is he... Owen? My high school crush? He was my senior in the music club and a super talented singer, guitarist, and composer. But how come he's my anti-fan? I never even spoke to him. The group buzzed about how pretentious I am. They even said Eric and I were fake dating just to cover up the news about our latest album flop. Ahem. Obviously, our love is real. I never tire of hearing trash talking about that Eric guy's songs, but it's closing time. If you posted about Barry's Blue, please claim your money from the counter before leaving. What? Owen actually paid them to slander my band? Why was he so intent on ruining my career? Did he have a personal vendetta against me? I just had to find my own way to figure all this out. Making myself one of them should do it. I immediately called to apply for the job. And I got it. Showtime. It's important to look the part. So I dressed up as this innocent looking girl for my first shift. Thanks to the magic of makeup, even I could hardly recognize myself. Call me Summer from now on. After the introduction, Owen immediately gave me tons of work. I had to do the heavy lifting and stinky, dirty work. I was a pampered star, not a grunt. Ugh, he's such an exploitive boss. I must have been crazy to have ever crushed on him. In the evening, the anti-fan group showed up again, followed by a familiar face. It's Rena, Owen's little sister. Back in high school, she was quite arrogant. It seemed like nothing had changed. Did you know that Sonya was such a weirdo in high school? Now that she's famous, she's acting like she's above everyone else. 
Stop right there, Carrot Hair. What's your name? Um, I'm Summer. So, Summer, here we've got a special requirement for every newbie. You have to pass the anti-fan test. Tell us, what do you think's the most irritating thing about Sonya? Ugh, now I have to defame myself? Actually, I was Sonya's childhood friend. Well, just a neighbor. She was the worst kid in the neighborhood. What did Sonya look like when she was young? And how was her personality? She was chubby and cruel to other kids. She threw bugs at them and never shared her toys. Take notes, guys. Remember to cite the source as Sonya's close neighbor. You can get some bonus, too, for contributing useful information like this. Was Rena also involved in this, along with her brother? When Rena left, the other anti-fans, Caleb, Violet, and June, still didn't leave, but turned to the stage and started tuning the instruments? What? They'd composed a whole song to mock me, not only about my surgery rumors, but also that I was a vain, hot-tempered, competitive, talentless, disrespectful, and never used my abundant money to help others. Her music was good, but the insolence killed their skills. I'm curious, why do people hate Sonya that much? She's rude and her music sucks. Yeah, her natural voice is good, but it doesn't have any emotions. She probably doesn't know anything about love and doesn't have any friends either. Those comments from the anti-fans got me thinking. I suppose I do find it hard to open up to people, and I can be a bit hot-headed sometimes, but am I really that unlikable? Ugh. Not the nose again, please! Huh? Owen? First you break the cups, now you're wasting sugar. Sugar? Seriously? Aren't you even going to ask if I'm hurt? If I leave here with just a scratch, this place will be finished, you know. This place was fine until you showed up. At least, Summer, you should learn how to apologize and thank. Suddenly, the anti-fan's words echoed in my head. As Summer, Owen still saw how much of a diva I was. That means, as Sonya... I must have been so despicable. Um, I'm sorry. I should have thanked you for helping me. Hmm, that's okay. I'm glad you're not hurt. Don't forget Rena's reward at the counter. Take it before you go. Why do you have to pay others to badmouth Sonya? I'm only going along with all this for my sister, but it brings more customers in, so whatever. So the person behind this is Rena? I don't think so. Someone must be pulling her strings. But who? I don't know. Why are you so concerned, Summer? I was just curious. <laughs> I used to think badly about Owen, but beneath his cold front, he's kind of sweet and caring. Just like years ago. I was trying to escape the rain and bumped into him. He saved me from falling. Didn't care how sweaty I was and even gave me his umbrella. But in front of my crush, I was too shy and embarrassed to say anything and hurried off. Since then, I didn't feel so uncomfortable hearing the anti-fans slate me and our band's decline. It was almost all true anyway. At least this way, I could learn from my past mistakes and become a way better person. Flowers grow in the strangest of places, right? Yeah, these anti-fans actually became my friends. Playing with them was way more fun than with the berries somehow. Okay guys, you need to share your music with the world. So, I signed up our budding band for a local music competition. Well, what? But we're not professionals. Do you really think we can win? Who cares? I always wanted to perform on a big stage. But what are we going to play? Use one of my songs if you want. I hear the payout is pretty good. Ooh, I love your songs. We practiced together every night. And everyone was so focused on this, they didn't post bad rumors about me anymore. Owen is truly a genius. Listening to him playing his intros always gave me goosebumps. And so, the image of a cute, talented Owen reappeared in my mind. Oh no, wake up, Sonya, you already have a boyfriend! Eric? Speaking of Eric, he's been ignoring all of my calls. I get it, he's busy rehearsing for the show, but didn't he promise to find a way to bring me back? Oh, I see, you're too busy playing bands to post anything. We have a show this weekend! You started this, didn't you, Summer? I knew you were trouble from the beginning. Get out of here! I'm on her side. Are you gonna kick me out too? Don't you see I'm doing this for you? Did you forget that Eric stole your songs and used them for his debut album? Rena, don't you think I already know what you're up to? You and that Eric guy are seeing each other, right? Doesn't he want you to spread rumors so he can replace Sonya, his current girlfriend? He says if I succeed, her place in the band will be mine. An affair is one thing, but he can't help you shine with that tuneless music. That's why I need your songs! Owen, just give me a few and everything will go smoothly. At that moment, it all became clear. The only album that made a name for the berries was actually stolen. 
And worse still, the person behind my plummeting career was my own boyfriend. That jerk Eric craves fame and would never let himself get caught up in a love triangle scandal. You know how important public opinion is to him. He's using you, and as soon as you give him what he wants, he'll drop you without a thought. I'm not that easily replaceable. What do you mean, Summer? I'm sorry for lying about who I really am, but not everything is fake. I wish you could feel it. Pass my words to him. I'm out. And you, Rena? That jerk doesn't deserve any of our love or trust. Even if I didn't want to go back to being the famous Sonya, I couldn't continue to be the carefree Summer either. I didn't realize they were there. They must have heard everything. You're Sonya? Not Summer? All this time? You lied to us! I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you or trick you. Your words made me want to change myself for the better. And your music taught and inspired me a lot. Caleb, Violet, June, I just want to be friends with you. Who wants to be your friend, you liar? I may have found out the truth about myself and Eric, but now I've lost my career, my friends, my boss, everything. I made such a mess of everything, and I didn't know how to fix it. I don't deserve to be Sonya, or even Summer. It must be a delivery guy. I barely had the energy to get up and open the door. Standing in front of me was... Owen? Did he come all the way here just to see me? Some... Sonya. I've been thinking a lot about your band and Eric, and I realized that this isn't your fault. You can't let Eric win. You're too talented for that. If you show everyone your true self, I just know they'll love you. Actually, there's one thing I want to confess to you. I used to have a crush on you in high school, but you probably didn't even know I existed. Really? That's so dumb. What do you mean? Actually, at that time I liked you too. You were so cute and shy with that beautiful voice. But when I came closer to talk to you, you just ran away. If I had been more confident and braver, maybe we could have become something different. What about now? I mean, do you still want to sing my song? It'll be an honor. Your song is always special. Owen pulled me to the competition and tenderly strapped the bass on for me. Going out there without the rest of the band seemed terrifying, but we couldn't give up. Owen was about to lead me on stage when Rena rushed over to us and grabbed my arm. Sonia, I messed up. It's true that Eric was using me, and I had been so blind to trust him that much. I've corrected the misinformation about you. I was hugging her when the rest of the anti-fans appeared. I apologized to them how I was now a better version of myself because of them. Turns out we really like Summer, so we forgive you. Now we're ready to rock the night. You can't sing with them, Sonia. That song is supposed to be the theme song in our next album. Eric! It's Owen's song, not yours. And didn't Rena tell you that I no longer give a damn about your band? I did. Seems he wasn't listening. We've published your dirty plan all over the forums, so everyone can see what a jerk you are. No, you have to come with me. Tell them you made it all up. Leave her alone. I won't let you take anything from me again. My song or my girl. She's our friend now, so excuse us. We need to get on stage and perform our song. I can't believe I'm back on stage again. Only this time, it's so much better. My bandmates are awesome. The song is amazing, and the crowd is going wild. I saw Eric shamefully disappear through the crowd. Tough luck. That's what being a big, slimy liar gets you. Toward the end of the song, Owen pulled me close to him and the crowd went silent. All I could hear was the beating of my heart when he gave me the best kiss ever. Not every day a girl outside the aerospace community like me could attend this creative science festival thingy, but here I was, all thanks to my genius boyfriend Mike, who just got accepted into MIT's aerospace engineering program. This is all really interesting. So great that Mike brought me here. Hey, you ruined my project. Who are you? Sorry, I, I'm Mike's, Mike? I can't believe he's talking to another girl when his girlfriend is in trouble here. The girl followed Mike and immediately fixed the model I just broke. Such an unfortunate brain behind her flashy clothes. Shh, keep it down. She's Mike's girlfriend. Really? Our valedictorian is into airheads? Huh? I thought Mike and Liana were a thing. Liana, the pretty girl who just fixed a freaking spacecraft model in a split second, is being paired with my boyfriend? I'm Chloe, by the way. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself sooner. I just, ugh, never felt so self-conscious before. Mike and I have been together since high school. Back then, I was popular and had many boys chasing me. Everyone seemed amazed that a girl like me was with a nerd like him. But now, Mike's already an intern at NASA despite being only a freshman. 
Looks like he's a celebrity among his peers, and I was just his brainless girlfriend. For the first time ever, I felt like I had no place being such an elite student's girlfriend. I couldn't stop thinking about what happened at the science festival, so I decided to talk about it in my talk show, Bubble Buzz. Although I didn't show my face, I had heaps of listeners and every time the show was on, they flooded my comments section with excitement. Welcome back, my friends. So today's topic is, can a person's heart change when they go to college? I have a friend, Sally. She's been with her boyfriend for two years, 10 months and 21 days. But now he's gone to college in another state, living among new friends and new girls. Should she be worried that she'll become old news? Obviously, out of sight, out of mind, your friend should dump him before he does. No matter how good a relationship is, it can't escape the three-year curse. The three-year thing is real. All high school romances are doomed in the real world. Mike and I had been together for almost three years. Was this three-year curse really hitting us? Every comment seemed to believe it, while user Twinkle Star seemed to think this whole curse was silly. Curses don't exist. Relationships aren't easy. Both partners have to be willing to make an effort in their long-term relationship. Two years or ten years, it's irrelevant. Why does someone as serious as Twinkle Star listen to my show anyway? Since my early days hosting the show, this person always comments with confusing and boring quotes. I'm sure the curse was not a silly thing at all. Whether it was my three-year friendship with my first best friend Ella, or my parents divorcing after three years of marriage, the three-year milestone was real. Actually, I do know one couple who beat the curse. They're my grandparents. Grandpa's rather a cold and reserved person who only had eyes for his wife. So I asked Grandma what the secret to their successful relationship was. First, be grateful for your partner and not take love for granted. Second, know him better than you know yourself. Third, learn to forgive and apologize. Was that it? That wasn't exactly helpful. Our relationship was in a life or death situation and I needed to really do something. Right that moment, someone appeared in the kitchen and I couldn't believe it. My sister Mindy. I hadn't seen her in ages since she moved out with dad. I explained my fears to Mindy and she seemed to understand exactly why I was so concerned. Don't worry, sis. I'll stay here for a while so I can help you two overcome this curse and reignite your passion. First of all, as Mike's the biggest nerd I know, you need to appear more academic. Taking Mindy's advice, I gave myself this academia aesthetic, then went to see Mike at the amusement park. Oh, look, there he is. Huh? Chloe? Um, you look different. Since when did you wear glasses? I've, um, always worn them, Mike. You must not have noticed. I stayed up late last night to watch a physics documentary. Now it's time to impress Mike with my knowledge about how water fountains actually work without electricity and run solely on gravity. How the fat in ice cream impacts the freezing point, and I could taste the fat droplets. And how g-force and inertia were taken into account when mechanics made roller coasters for the thrill. But he didn't seem impressed at all. Chloe, you're not yourself today. Are you okay? I'm not okay. I've been wiggling my foot at you for ages, but you never noticed my undone laces. You didn't let me try your ice cream first, as you always do, and you didn't notice the effort I put into learning all this sciencey stuff for you. I'm sorry. I have this big project on my mind, and... Mike Jenkins, you've changed. The Mike I know and love was attentive and wouldn't let me walk around with untied shoes. You don't love me anymore. It all got too much for me, so I hurried off. Well, as quickly as I could with my shoelaces flailing. As soon as I got home, I phoned Mindy and told her everything. I was so lucky to have my big sis. OMG, he did what? It sounds like he just doesn't care about you anymore. Do you think? Um, maybe... Maybe he was just... No. If he cared, he would have come after you. Instead, he let you walk on dangerous sneakers. Mindy was right. Mike grew cold on me. This three-year curse was real. Now what should I do? There's only one thing. You'll have to test him. I've been sitting here for the past hour and Mike hasn't... Here he comes. This was Mindy's idea. Faking a car malfunction and calling Mike for help. Wow, you're so good. I'd still be stranded here alone without you. You could have asked someone else or called a garage. There wasn't even anything wrong with... It doesn't matter. But you're my boyfriend. Yes, your very busy boyfriend who lives in a different state. Anyway, I got a dash, and we'll have to take a rain check on next week. I have a lot on my plate. Then Mike left, leaving me more afraid of losing him than ever. As if he just left. His new environment changed him even more than I thought. Chloe, you have to infiltrate his space now before you lose him forever. So I went sneaking into Mike's dorm room and transformed it from nerdy to romantic chic. 
I hear footsteps. I better hide. I can't wait for him to see it. There's Mike, but, huh? Who's with him? Oh, wow. Romantic much? Then the other person started taking their clothes off? I leaped out of the closet ready to tackle this man-stealer to the ground, but hold on a second. That's actually a man. Mike's roommate, Gus? Chloe, um, what are you doing here? I'm sorry. I just wanted to surprise you and, and ask you to come on a date with me today, tomorrow, whenever you're free. I told you I'm busy this week. I have an inspection tomorrow. So, you mean I'm bothering you? You don't need me anymore? Here, you can use my ID card and go with Mike to the inspection. Make it a hot date. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. One way or another, my infiltration mission was a success. Hehehe. <laughs> the next day, I came to this technical area with Mike and just stuck to him, not knowing what else I was supposed to do. Chloe, don't touch anything, okay? Mike, there you are. You have to come and see this. She dragged him off, and did she just smirk at me? Ugh! What an awful pick-me girl. She was obviously trying to separate us. No way was I gonna let her get away with that. I'd show them all that I deserve to be with him. While Liana's by herself walking around with a VR headset, I came to tell her to keep her hands off my boyfriend. Oh, there you are. Stay away from Mike. Little do you know that he has a girlfriend. You're just a clingy airhead that he's too polite to break up with. I'm the perfect girl for him, not you. I, I'm the most influential radio host on social media, and a third wheel like you call me an airhead? I'll make sure everyone knows what a horrible person you are. Really, so scary. As if I'll be worried about those pathetic gossip girls. How dare she? I pushed her, and suddenly, smash. Her headset broke into pieces on the floor. Oh no, Mike told me not to touch anything. What are you doing here? What happened? I'm so sorry, Chloe. I know that you're not okay with this whole thing, but I'm Mike's teammate and we have to interact a lot. Nothing is going on between us. You're overreacting. Then she ran away in tears like she wasn't at fault. She's lying. I didn't say that. She said she wants. Chloe, enough. I'm too busy to worry about what chaos you're going to cause next. I think we should take a break. He took the ID pass off me, leaving me feeling like my whole world had crumbled. After crying an ocean of tears, I decided to make this right. I threw away my ego and texted him first. But before I hit send, I received a message from Mike saying he was sorry and we would have a trip to celebrate our three-year anniversary. This meant we weren't over and the curse wasn't true. Ooh, I needed to figure out which outfits to bring. I got everything packed and ready for our vacation of a lifetime. It was gonna be so romantic. But all of a sudden, Liana rushed to us and flung her arms around Mike. My pet dog, Nova, she's, she's passed away. I can't be alone right now. I'd rather die. That lying party pooper. Poor Mike didn't know what to say, so she just jumped in the back seat without my permission. No problem. The more, the merrier. I'll invite my sister to join us too. Mindy proved to be super useful, always interjecting whenever Liana approached Mike. But Liana just became more and more shameless. She glued herself to Mike and had the audacity to lie down next to him, like I was invisible, and even ate his ice cream. Worse still, my oblivious boyfriend didn't seem bothered at all. She's more cunning than I thought. You need to step up your game. It was such a beautiful night, but that third wheel Liana was buzzing around Mike like a mosquito. Then she started talking about physics stuff, and now he's so caught up in their conversation, I may as well have disappeared. Hmm, how could I make Liana see Mike loves me, not her? Well, I wasn't sure if he loves me anymore. Chloe, 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 you long for attention so badly you're willing to hurt yourself. She's already hurt because of you. This is her special three-year anniversary, and you invited yourself like how you've always wormed your way in. I bet you don't even have a dog. I diverted my gaze from a fake crying Liana to a confused-looking Mike. Chloe, what are you trying to do? I'm worried you've lost your passion for me because we're at the three-year mark. We have different interests, and I can't help but feel insecure about us. If you keep acting like this... Well, I just don't know. I've been thinking about our future, too, and I've decided it's time for us to... Oh, no, no, no! This isn't happening! I think I'm pregnant! We got back two days ago, and Mike still hadn't contacted me. This curse had caught up with me, and I lost him for good. I just wish I hadn't lied about the baby. Then maybe our breakup wouldn't have been so awkward. This called for retail therapy. I stepped outside and saw Mike with a massive suitcase. Chloe, I've abandoned the project and dropped out of college. I'm going to take care of you, both of you. 
Mike scurried around the house to make it pregnant woman friendly. He threw out all junk food, coffee, and even mayonnaise. Also, my high heels were packed away and Mozart was played everywhere in the house. Apparently, it'll make the baby a genius. We were going to have the perfect, happy family life. But when I went to my room to get my laptop for my next radio show, I couldn't find it anywhere. I asked Mike and he said, I packed it up with your high heels, makeup, books, and put them all in storage. You don't need any distractions. Just me, you, and the baby from now on. No more radio, studying, or friends. We can have a bunch of kids and grow old in this house. What? This wasn't what I wanted. Neither of us should have boring, unfulfilling lives or give up our dreams, right? I might not have my laptop, but I still had my phone. Welcome back. Today's topic is my friend Sally, again. She lied about being pregnant so her boyfriend wouldn't leave her. Should she keep lying or tell the truth? This time, Twinkle Star appeared again. I know she's always been a brave girl who isn't afraid of admitting her own faults and correcting her mistakes. She should tell her boyfriend the truth and explain how much she loves him. Hmm, sounds oddly specific. Who's this person? Actually, Bubble Buzz, we know each other. Before I could ask him anything else, Twinkle Star went offline. Whoever that was, I think they were right. So I went downstairs to talk to Mike, only he wasn't there. Instead, Mindy jumped out of nowhere holding a pregnancy test and a bottle of Coke. I just need to dunk this in here and the plus sign will show up clear as day in case Mike has any doubt about the baby. No need to. I'm going to tell him the truth. Are you sure about that? What if Mike gets mad? I stopped and thought about it. No, as scary as it was, I couldn't do this anymore. I was looking out for Mike by telling him the truth. Where was he? He had to be around here somewhere. Liana, why was she here with Mike? Mike, I'm sorry, but Chloe's not pregnant. She admitted on her radio show. You deserve to be with someone who wouldn't make up such awful lies. Someone like me. Oh no, I lost the chance to tell him firsthand. Now Mike would never talk to me ever again. Chloe, wait. I couldn't turn around and bear the disappointment in his eyes. I couldn't blame anyone, any third wheel or curse for destroying my relationship. Hey there, I know this is an unscheduled show, but I wanted to talk to y'all. That girl I talked about yesterday, Sally, well, she's me. I faked being pregnant to keep my relationship, but my boyfriend hates me now. I was so terrified of this three-year curse that I became this jealous monster. Mike even dropped out because of me. I'm so selfish for expecting him to spend every minute of his day with me. He needs his own life too. We both do. It's the time apart that makes our time together more exciting. And our love more passionate. Now we've broken up and it's all my fault. I stopped to catch my breath. Who told you I wanted to break up? Didn't, didn't you say you thought carefully about our future and made a decision? You know what? After all your silly shenanigans, including faking your pregnancy, I'm still madly in love with you. So the decision I made was, Chloe Ruth Evanson, you're crazy, kooky, and one of a kind. I can't stand the thought of not having you in my life. Will you marry me? Yes! But, Mike, after our engagement, you should continue your studies, projects, internship, and whatnot. You don't have to stay by my side all the time. What? I thought you'd like that. We can be together all day and make enough babies for a soccer team, right? Relax, I'm just kidding. I knew you were lying about the baby all along. Your grandpa told me. Turns out, Twinkle Star was none other than my grandpa, who saw that I needed some guidance and tried to give me objective advice. Mike only went along with the lie to tease me. Hmm, who knew my nerdy boyfriend could be so playful? Or should I say, my fiancé? Why wasn't it working? I followed all the steps, but still, nothing. At that moment, my best friend Harry walked towards me and asked with a confused look, Hey, what you doing? <sighs> hey, Harry, I'm just working on this plan to become popular, but it isn't going so well. I changed my style and posted more on social media, but I'm still not cool. You're probably wondering why I was desperately wanting to be popular, right? Well, it's all because of my annoying hiccups. Last year, I was on stage performing the play Our Town when I suddenly started to hiccup, constantly. I couldn't stop, and the whole audience started to laugh at me. In the end, they had to replace me with my understudy. Not only was it the most humiliating moment of my life, but I've also been teased about it ever since. This year, I wanted to become popular. Then everyone would forget about the hiccuping incident. <sighs> if only becoming popular was easy. Hey, you could help me. 
No way! Your plan is crazy! At that moment, the new student, Amanda, passed by, surrounded by a bunch of other students. Why is this girl so popular? I mean, she's only been here a week. You don't know? She's Dustin's sister. He's already the most popular guy in school. So being his sister makes her popular too. Duh. That's it, Harry. The fastest way for me to climb the popularity ladder is to date Dustin. At first, Harry seemed confused by this, but then he suddenly agreed to help me. With one condition, of course, that after I succeeded in becoming Dustin's girlfriend, I had to introduce Amanda to him. I knew it! He had a crush on her. Every guy in the school does. Fine, I'll help him, as I need Harry in this anyway. He plays a crucial role in my plan, and you'll soon figure out why. After school, I was waiting in a corner at the parking lot when Harry walked towards me, followed by Dustin. I heard you're giving tutor lessons. Yeah, that's right. I don't take money. I just need... What do you need? I need you to pretend to be my boyfriend. Dustin burst out laughing, but then when he saw our serious looks, he stopped. Um, you two are crazy, but I do need to pass math, so... Okay. However, my grades have to improve within two weeks. Then we have a deal. Deal? I grinned. Within two weeks? That's so easy. What a catch. You must be wondering how we managed to pull that off. Well... Harry's on Dustin's soccer team and overheard the coach tell him if he didn't improve his math grade, he'd be kicked off the team. Basically, we used Dustin's weakness to get the deal. <laughs> I know I had no chance with him by using my lousy flirting skills, so it's time to use my greatest strength, my brain. Pretty smart, huh? I started to tutor Dustin. Then after two weeks, he shot up two grades. And that's when he held up his end of the deal and pretended to be my boyfriend. The next day, Dustin and I held hands and walked into school. And just as I expected, everybody was gawping at us. I even heard them whisper about me, Is that the hiccup girl with Dustin? And, Whoa, since when were those two a thing? Ha! <laughs> and that's not all. Wherever I went, people would follow me. And in every class, everyone wanted to sit next to me. Finally, I was popular, and I loved it. i just finished tutoring Dustin at his house and was about to head home when his mom appeared and invited me to stay for dinner. Awkward, but I didn't want to be rude, so I said yes. Besides, this was a great opportunity to talk to Amanda. I was sitting next to Dustin at the dinner table when Amanda walked in and gave me a dirty look. What is she doing here? Amanda, manners! Um... Okay, had I upset her somehow? After we finished eating, I helped Amanda clean up. I pulled some homemade chocolate cookies out of my bag and gave my friendliest smile as I said, Um, my friend Harry, he likes you. I was wondering if... Without letting me finish my sentence, Amanda interrupted me. Sorry, let me stop you right there. First, I don't eat cookies. Gross. Second, I assume you're asking me if I want to go out with your friend, right? Um, no, because he's a loser just like you. It's embarrassing enough that Dustin is dating you. Then she walked off, leaving me standing there dumbfounded. Oh my god, couldn't believe what I just heard. How could a person be so rude? Ugh. The next day at school, I wanted to tell Harry to give up on Amanda, but as soon as I caught sight of him, he ran towards me, hugged me and said, Emily, you're a matchmaking genius. Thank you. Huh? What do you mean by that? Amanda just asked me if I wanted to come to her party this weekend. Isn't that great? Yay! What on earth was going on? But Harry looked so happy that I just couldn't tell him the truth. One thing's for sure, there's something sus about Amanda. Of course, I was going to that party too, because I was Dustin's girlfriend, remember? Wow, we were actually at a cool kid's party. Her first time ever. This was awesome. Harry even got a bit emotional. <laughs> what a baby. Dustin and I teamed up to play beer pong, and it was so much fun, and unexpectedly, we won. We were so excited, and both of us cheered with joy and hugged each other without thinking. 
Oops, didn't see that coming. But what happened next was even crazier. Everybody started to cheer, kiss, kiss, kiss. Oh boy, they couldn't be serious, right? I just laughed it off and hoped everyone would stop. But no, they just kept cheering on. Suddenly, Dustin grabbed my face and kissed me right on the lips. I didn't push him away. Oh no, instead, I closed my eyes and got carried away. I even lifted up one leg. Oh, and FYI, that was my first kiss. After that, we both turned bright red and avoided eye contact. Ugh, my whole body felt hot like I was having a fever or something. <laughs> anyway, the party was everything I dreamed of and more. The next day, Harry and I arrived at school in a super good mood, but suddenly we saw a bunch of students gathering around someone. We squished through the crowd and saw Amanda crying. Turns out, somebody from the party had stolen two of her mom's Fabergé eggs. Then, one of Amanda's friends suggested checking all backpacks and lockers of everyone who went to the party last night. But the chances are low. The culprit must have been able to hide all the evidence by now. Still, we should try everything we can, right? I couldn't bear seeing Amanda crying her eyes out like this. Then he gently patted her shoulder. Hey, that was smooth. Way to go, Harry. And so, we checked a few people's belongings, and still nothing was found. Then it was Harry's turn. He opened the locker, and oh my god, one of the Fabergé eggs was in there. But how? He would never do such a thing. I opened my locker, and what? There was the other one! What on earth was going on? Suddenly, Amanda started shouting at us. I knew it was you two! Hey everybody, Emily over here manipulated Dustin by using his weaknesses, his love of soccer, and his dislike for math. Then she forced him to pretend to be her boyfriend just so she could be cool. Everybody started glaring at me like I was the villain, but I wasn't. There was a misunderstanding. I looked over to Dustin for help but he just avoided my gaze, then walked off. I didn't know what to do, so I just stood there in shock until Harry dragged me off with him. Well, after that, I was more popular than ever. I was now known as the girl who took advantage of a guy to get popular and then stole from him. Worse, Amanda wouldn't listen to me. Harry and I were clearly framed. <sighs> I wish I could go back to my normal life before I made that stupid deal with Dustin. Oh, but then that kiss wouldn't have happened. Oh boy, might I have fallen for Dustin? Then suddenly I got a text from Amanda. It was a clip from the recent party with the message, You're nothing to Dustin. Why are you dating this loser? Wasn't she the girl who hiccuped during the play? <laughs> I will use her until the end of this semester. Oh my, I couldn't believe he said that. I knew he didn't like me in the way I liked him. But did he have to be so mean? The clip automatically replayed again. Ugh, watching this one time was bad enough. But wait, there was a detail in the clip that caught my attention. I rewound it and, oh my god, there were the two missing Fabergé eggs. The clip was recorded at midnight, but Harry and I left the party way before then. I quickly rushed over to Dustin and Amanda's house and showed them the video. I don't remember you both leaving earlier. What if you're lying? Well, I noticed your front door has cameras. If you want, we could check them. Dustin turned to Amanda and confusingly asked, Did you put those eggs in Emily and Harry's lockers? Amanda said nothing, but her head down said it all. But why would you do that? Emily didn't do anything wrong. Because I don't like her being your girlfriend. I, I like you. Um, what? Isn't she his sister? Oh, turns out they aren't actually siblings. Phew. That would have been weird. The truth is their parents were really close. And when Amanda's parents died in an accident, Dustin's family took her in. So Amanda was like a sister to Dustin, but Amanda, on the other hand, has been in love with him for a long time. I decided not to make a big deal out of it. As long as she posted a status on social media saying this was all a misunderstanding and that we didn't steal from her, and she reluctantly agreed. Afterward, I immediately got out of there without saying anything else to Dustin, but he ran after me and apologized for not defending me the other day. He just couldn't choose between me and Amanda. And then he said, That clip you saw wasn't what you think. Ugh. What's there not to understand? It was so obvious. Then what is it? Please tell me. But Dustin just stood there silent and stared down at his sneakers, just like I thought. 
there's nothing else to explain, so I stormed off. The next day, Amanda posted the status, and our names were finally cleared. My life is back to being boring, but it's okay, as I now know that being popular isn't what brings me happiness. Oh, and about me and Dustin? Well, a few days later, he sent me a video. It was the same clip from the party. At first, this frustrated me. I mean, why would he make me endure watching that again? But then I noticed that this clip was longer, so out of curiosity, I pressed play. And you won't believe what happened in the second half of that video. After the part where Dustin said he just wanted to use me, everybody teased him more. He got angry and yelled. Yes, Emily is weird, but weird in a good way. I like the way she smells books every time she opens one, and the cute way she gets embarrassed when she sneezes loudly. And do you know what I like most about her? that she hiccups every time she's nervous. You heard me right, I like her. You see, Dustin likes me too. Amanda cut this part of the video out on purpose so I'd misjudge him. But now that I knew the truth, what do you think I did? Yeah, of course I forgave him. I mean, how couldn't I? <laughs> hmm, I wonder what's taking Valerie so long. She's been in that changing room for ages. Valerie? Is everything okay in there? Don't force it if it doesn't fit. No, this is the last dress in store. I just need to breathe in for a bit longer. So? It's beautiful, isn't it? Valerie spun around. Then suddenly... Yep. Trying to squeeze into a dress two sizes too small for her, then it split. <sighs> The giggles around us started. Valerie blushed, hurriedly paid for the dress, and pulled me out of the shop. Why am I so fat? Ugh! I just want to feel pretty on my date. If I was skinny like you, I wouldn't have this problem. Poof! You know, it's not as easy as you think being thin. Yep, you heard me right. Being thin has its downsides. First of all, fashion. My nightmare! I have to wear an extra small size, and the clothes still hang off me. Actually, most of my clothes are from kids' stores, so I feel so untrendy. Then in winter, I have to wear tons of layers just so I don't freeze to death. And in the summer, <sighs> I can't wear cute clothes as I look like a coat hanger. Not only that, because I'm so skinny, people often ask me to do nonsense stuff. Once, I was studying in my room when suddenly I heard my sister Camilla calling me. She'd forgotten her keys and forced me to climb through her tiny window gap to get them. Seriously, I can't even! Then, on another occasion, Valerie made me crawl into the classroom locker to help her cheat on her Spanish test. Unfortunately, the teacher walked in while this was happening and gave me a week's worth of detentions, of course. Ugh! Oh my god, No Way Home is so good. I literally can't think of one bad thing to say about it. Yep, the part near the end? Ah! Yep, guess what? I'd managed to trap my foot in a manhole. Man, what rotten luck. I tried pulling my leg free, but it was no use. It wouldn't budge. There I was, freaking out that I'd be stuck here forever, and all my friends could do was huddle together and ask me questions like, Madeline, how on earth did you get your foot in such a small slot? Wow, that's unbelievable. Even Jaden, my bookworm friend, took out a ruler from his backpack and started measuring how wide the slot was. Grr. My dear friends, I'm being stuck down here. Stop gawping and help me! Finally, they tried helping me out, but in the end, we had to call the rescue squad. By this point, a massive crowd had gathered around me, and strangers were filming me. When I was finally free, everyone looked at me and held back their laughter. Even Parker, my crush, was smiling. Jeez, this was beyond embarrassing. But... A hot guy like Parker would never notice a moving skeleton like me anyway. <sighs> Don't think like that, Maddie. You're so pretty. Show me some confidence, would you? Valerie said as she nudged my arm. 
I put the book down and glared at her, and suddenly noticed Parker walking towards our table, smiling. And, yep, he said he wanted to sit with us. Even though I was cheering inside of my head, I still had to act composed. And, oh my god, can you believe he even said I was cute? After that day, Valerie kept on encouraging me, saying he had definitely given me a green light. So, finally, I gathered my courage to write down all my feelings for Parker on a note and clipped it to his notebook. At the end of class that day, he came to my desk and took my hand. Yay! Everything was fine, great even, until one day when the two of us were taking a romantic walk past the Swan Lake, Parker suddenly turned to me and said, You're so beautiful, Maddie. And if you just put on a few more pounds, I swear you'll be the hottest girl at school. Yes, I know, but it's hard for me to gain weight. No big deal. Just leave it to me. I'll fatten you up. I thought Parker was just joking, but it turns out he was being deadly serious. Since that day, every time we went on a date, instead of taking me to the bowling alley and movies as usual, Parker would take me out to eat. I swear, I've tried all the restaurants in our town. More surprisingly, on my birthday, Parker even gave me a bouquet of fried chicken. How romantic! But this didn't change anything, as my weight still stayed the same. Parker was disappointed when he peered over me and saw the scales hadn't budged. Then he sighed out. How come you and Valerie are friends, but look totally opposite? Here comes our adorable chubby Valerie. What? Parker called Valerie adorable again. This wasn't the first time either. Annoyed, I put down my fork and walked away from them. After that, I started avoiding Valerie. I did homework with other friends, sat with other girls at lunch, and every time I happened to see Valerie, I turned around and walked away. Honestly, I didn't want it to be this way, but... Just seeing her made me uncomfortable. But I couldn't bear to see my boyfriend call my BFF cute while he thought I was too skinny. <sighs> then summer break finally rolled around. I thought it'd be just me and Parker, but then he went off to a summer camp in Spain. <sighs> the plan was all ruined. So I spent a whole sunny day inside sulking. What's wrong? Are you bored because your lover is away? So why don't you take this time to surprise him when he returns? Surprise? A great idea popped into my head. But... But how do I get chubby? Easy peasy. Okay, if it's that easy, then show me. Okay, if you do my summer homework for me. What? She's such an opportunist but I really wanted to pile on the pounds and please Parker. So, without hesitation, I nodded in agreement. So, from that day on, I started following Camilla's weight gain plan. I switched veggies for greasy foods, and my main meal was always late at night. I also changed water for milkshakes, but I did have to stop drinking them when the smell of milk alone made me feel sick. Seeing me eating crazy like that, my parents worriedly said, Madeline, eating healthily is important, else your health will be affected. But I ignored their advice. This time, I definitely had to gain weight. Finally, after a month of trying, I gained some weight. Yay! I looked a lot more attractive now, didn't I? I was studying myself in the mirror when I heard my phone beep. It was Parker. He was coming over tomorrow with a present for me. The next day, I put on this hot dress that I'd never felt confident enough to wear before, and I asked Camilla to help me do my makeup. As soon as I finished, I eagerly waited for Parker in the living room. The doorbell rang, I excitedly opened the door, but as soon as he saw me, Parker quickly said, Oh, sorry, I have the wrong house. Then he started to leave. Huh? He didn't recognize me? This will be fun. No, honey, you're not mistaken. It's me. Your destiny. 
Madeline? Is that really you? Oh my, how on earth can you be this big? We've only been apart for a month. So, you don't think I'm prettier now? To my surprise, Parker shook his head. No, no, you're so fat now. It doesn't look okay. Lose some weight. Huh? This was so confusing. I thought he wanted me to be bigger. As annoying as this was, I still listened to Parker and tried to lose the weight I'd put on. <sighs> so it turns out that losing weight is far trickier than it sounds. Actually, it's a million times harder to lose it than it is to gain it. After a month of healthy eating and exercise, I gained another pound. Ugh! Stop eating that. Are you giving up already? You must try harder. What? It's just some popcorn. Why does he have to be so rude about this? I'll give you two weeks to lose weight. Else we're done. Huh? What did he just say? Done? He was the one who wanted me to gain weight in the first place. Now he was threatening to break up with me if I didn't lose it. How ridiculous. You know what? I don't need two weeks. Let's end it right now. It's clear you never loved me at all. You only like my appearance. If you truly cared about me, you wouldn't care what size I was. Then I walked off. Ugh, how could I have been so stupid? For the entirety of my relationship with that jerk Parker, I was blindly following him. I only cared about pleasing him, and it cost me so many things including my best friend. I needed to apologize to her right away. I nervously knocked on the door, then waited. Finally, Valerie opened it, but on seeing me, she went to shut it. I'm so sorry. Just let me explain, please. Valerie, I'm so sorry. It was all because I was afraid Parker would leave me for you. But I realize now that he's a massive jerk and I was an idiot for ever trying to change for him. Jeez, you're crazy. Parker is totally not my type. I scratched my head and told her about how terrible Parker had treated me and how I'd foolishly listened to him. Man, that douchebag! Then she hugged me. Valerie confessed to me that she'd been trying to lose weight by lowering her calorie intake, but the pounds were coming off, and worse still, she felt weak and tired all the time. I nodded in agreement with her. So, from then on, Valerie and I made a promise to love ourselves, regardless of what size we were, and to never let anyone try and change us. And look, that's Walker and Joel, our awesome boyfriends who love us just the way we are. And you know what? It feels so good not caring what other people think. So, don't ever let idiots put you down. Because when you allow yourself to just be you, then you can finally realize just how beautiful you truly are. I was completely immersed in this beautiful harmony that me and my dad were playing, until... What on earth are you two doing? Startled. I turned around to see Siren standing there with fiery eyes. Oh, God. I came back to my senses at once and realized that next to me... The man I was jamming with was not my dad, but Isaac, her boyfriend. Oh no, what had I done? I quickly wiped my tears away and was about to leave. But Isaac took my hand and gave me this confused look. Being back here in this house was difficult enough without getting involved in this love triangle. So I tried to pull my hand free and ran out of there. Yes, it's me again, Hazel. In the last part of my story... My friends embroiled me into helping their idol Isaac and his actress girlfriend Siren escape from the public eye for a bit. Now I'm stuck in my family's old home and having to confront my past. All these memories flooded my mind. Some good, some bad. And before I knew it, I was mixing the past with reality. And that's how I accidentally played the piano with Isaac and made Siren green with envy. At that moment... Siren swung open the door and charged toward me. Hey, don't let me catch you flirting with my BF again. Excuse me? What did you say? 
he's not even my type. Besides, having you as a love rival sounds like way more hassle than it's worth. She gave me this lingering scowl. Clearly she was furious with me, but she must have decided there was nothing else she could say on this matter. However, this didn't stop her from being the most demanding, frustrating diva on the planet. She stuck her nose up at the food and drinks we served her and insisted that she couldn't possibly consume anything that wasn't organic. She threw the clothes that we lent her down the stairs because, quote, those vulgar outfits didn't suit her. Then she asked Ivy to go get her designer ones. Once, Zoe even had to drive over an hour to the mall just for a few scented candles. Why, you ask? Well, Siren accused me of exuding this bad energy that had been affecting her sleep and her well-being, so she needed to cleanse the aura around here. Poof! This was nonsense. Once her head touched the pillow, she slept like a log. It seems that living in the same house as their idol and his girlfriend wasn't exactly all it's cracked up to be. Isn't that right, Ivy and Zoe? However, contrary to Siren the Nightmare, Isaac surprised me quite a lot by actually being a great help around the house. He was an excellent cook and a dab hand at fixing things. Okay, I admit that I used to think he was just one of those useless celebs out there, but it seems he had no problem with pulling his weight. Anyway, this manner of his did somewhat make up for the obnoxious attitude of his girlfriend, which made this whole thing a bit more bearable. Until this one time. We were rowing on the river near the mansion. Well, I was rowing, to be exact. Just me, as what could we expect from our two superstars? But it's pretty out here, isn't it? It was Siren's bright idea, as she wanted some new Insta photos. You're probably wondering where Zoe and Ivy are. Yep, they're scouring the shops a few towns over for ethical foie gras. Look at her. Saying she's feeling sick, she couldn't row. But apparently, she was well enough to smile for the camera and strike dozens of different poses. Suddenly, Siren decided to stand up to get better lighting, which made the whole boat shake. I shouted at her to sit down, but then before I properly knew what was going on, the boat was turning sideways and I tumbled into the water. I flailed my arms and legs out and tried my best to raise my head above the water, but it was no use. I couldn't stop myself from sinking beneath it. I honestly believed this was it. The world started to darken around me. When suddenly, an arm grabbed me and pulled me ashore. Hazel, can you hear me? I slowly opened my eyes and saw Isaac's worried face peering down at me. Hazel, thank goodness. He gently helped me sit up, then asked me if I was all right. For a few fleeting moments... The warmth from his body made me flush. Clearly, nearly drowning had made me delirious. I mean, I couldn't have feelings for him. Could I? Before I could ponder on this thought any more, a drenched siren dripped her way over to us. Isaac, why did you rescue her instead of me? Siren, this is not the time for being dramatic. I was hardly going to come to you, an expert swimmer, over Hazel who was actually drowning. Hearing Isaac say that, she rolled her eyes, then stormed off, leaving a wet footprint trail in her wake. The last thing we needed in the house was more tension, so I immediately turned to him and said I was fine, and he should go and sort things out with his girlfriend. Listen, Hazel, Siren's not my girlfriend. I don't like her in that way, but as for you and me, we clearly have a connection. I stared at him in complete open-mouthed shock. Did he really just say that? Or perhaps I had a concussion and was imagining things. Siren's like my little sister. I'll explain this later, but first you need to rest. Then he wrapped his arms around me and guided me back to the house. I spent the rest of that day in bed feeling feverish. Then at dawn the next morning, I awoke to a commotion coming from downstairs. Guys? <sighs> What's all the noise about? It's Isaac and Siren! They've gone! And they've taken the car! What? That was our only mode of transport out of here! How could they be so selfish to just abandon us here like this? We tried contacting Isaac countless times, but no answer. Great. Here we are now in this remote area, where it would take hours to even find a passerby to hitchhike. Not to mention how risky it'd be. Everything was a mess. We were panicking when suddenly the door burst open 
and walked in a smiling, arm-linked Isaac and Siren. Where have you been? You can't just leave like that without telling us. Oh, Ivy lent us the car. Didn't she say anything? Both Zoe and I turned our gazes on Ivy. She stammered. But, but I think you guys just went out for a while. Not disappeared all night unreachable. Relax. All this tension will give you wrinkles. Then Siren smirked at me as she flicked back her hair and then continued. We went to a drive-in cinema and it was so romantic. We didn't want the evening to end, so we strolled around town until the early hours. What did she mean by that? So much for him seeing her as a sister. I felt like such a fool for believing his lies. We altered our entire plans to help you both hide from society, and this is how you thank us? By pulling a stunt like this? No more. Get out of here! Right now! Before anyone could say anything, my phone buzzed. It was my friend Erica. She asked me if the stories about me being in love with Isaac were true. Huh? What was she on about? In my panic, I ended the call and went online to check it out. Turns out on the Instagram account of the store where I customized our matching hoodies, the shop owner had posted a photo of me wearing it. Naturally, it didn't take the fan maniacs long to do their research and find out all about me. But worse still, another current trending post was one from Isaac's management company, confirming that we were officially dating. What kind of nonsense is this? I immediately told Isaac to call his company and put it on speaker. Isaac, we hit a jackpot! You probably know the iconic pianist and composer Edward Moretz, right? Hazel Moretz is his daughter! You... you mean... Everyone gasped at me in shock. Maybe it's time for me to reveal the secrets of my past, the truth that's been hidden for so long. Yes, Edward Moretz is my father, but I made a promise to myself ten years ago that I would never speak to him again. Isaac's manager continued to brazenly talk about how the scandal with me would benefit Isaac's career, so there was no need to hide it. At that moment, Siren shouted, What on earth are you saying? Hey, are you with Siren again? I already told you not to mess with that girl unless you want to get yourself in trouble. Shut up! Siren furiously grabbed Isaac's phone and ended the call. Isaac, tell everyone that the one you love is me, not her. Siren, we were never in love. You're going too far. What? You guys aren't dating? So we misunderstood it all from the beginning? I knew right away there was something wrong. Yet you pretended to be his real girlfriend and treated us like your minions. Siren stood there with a red face, fists clenched. I gave you my heart, but all you do is hurt me. This time you've made a big mistake, Isaac. Just wait and see. Siren left for her room, but this time neither of us stopped her or comforted her. The next morning, we found out that Siren was gone. None of us knew where she was. We all just hoped that she wasn't so fueled with anger that she'd cause us even more problems. We quickly packed our things into the car, preparing to return to our normal life. When out of nowhere, a bunch of reporters and journalists appeared and surrounded us. Isaac, Miss Sirenwild has accused Ms. Moretz of wrecking your relationship. Is this true? Does that mean you ran away from all the shows to go on a secret date with Ms. Moretz? Ms. Moretz, your father was known for breaking not only yours, but also another family apart. All for his own selfish needs. Are you following in his footsteps? Scary flashlights were everywhere. Suddenly I found myself transported back to that terrible day ten years ago, when Dad's affair went public and the reporters hounded us in this exact same spot. Those heartless flashlights are just as intense now as they were back then. A memory of my mom's distraught face popped into my mind. Puffy eyes, tear-stained cheeks, a fearful look. Yet the reporters were relentless vultures, firing questions at her regardless of her vulnerable state. That's the day I made a promise to myself that not only would I never pursue music, but I'd also never forgive my father. Amid the panic, an arm pulled me into the car, and we drove away from the crowd. It was Isaac. He put on some piano music to help calm me down, and he continued driving, eventually stopping at a small grocery store. Hazel, please drink this. Sorry for dragging you into all this. The thing is, I've been unhappy with my management company for a while now. 
They won't let me make the music I want to, but I didn't expect them to go as low as forcing me into their web of lies just for fame. I know how you feel. I used to long to become a pianist like my dad, but then he crushed my dreams. To further his career, he cheated on my mom with another married woman and left our family behind. I grew to hate the complex world of artists. I vowed to never become one of them. And then I gradually began to despise the sound of the piano, too. I'm sorry to hear that story. But art isn't to blame. It reflects lies genuinely, doesn't it? I heard your piano melodies and you are truly gifted. Be honest with your feelings and don't let anyone else interfere with them. Trying to deny your own passion and emotions will only make you miserable. Isaac's right. I'd let my dad's mistakes alter the pathway to my dreams. Not making music made me miserable. I felt like there was a part of me missing. One that nothing else could fill. Why should I be the one to suffer like this? When it hadn't even been me that done anything wrong. Look at me now. Can you believe it? I've rekindled my passion for piano, and now I'm happier than ever. After all that runway pop star drama, Isaac left his management company and collaborated with me to make music for true art. This is our latest charity event. It's pretty neat, huh? That's all thanks to Zoe and Ivy. They work for us now. They're in charge of arranging our busy schedules and organizing our events. The four of us make the best team. I guess you're wondering what happened to Siren. Last I heard, she set her sights on her latest movie co-star. Hmm. Wish her good luck is all I can say. As for Isaac and me, well, since the media claimed that we were a couple, we might as well have turned that fake news into reality. Hi, Mia here. Not to brag, but since childhood, I've always been kinda a genius. I've already stacked up over 20 science-based awards, and by adding this one more trophy into my collection, I even got to skip a grade. Your achievements at such a young age are admirable. What's your plan next? Well, I've decided to drop out of school. Yep, that's my plan. With as impressive of a profile, I'm just one research paper away from being accepted onto the Space Up Astronomical Research Program. Why waste time on boring classes, right? But ugh, mom and dad didn't like the idea of me not graduating. So after a lot of compromises, I did get to move to Quebec with my grandparents for a year. But I still had to go to school there. And voila, here I am in Canada, ready to conquer my dream. But why was there this angry crowd in front of my new home? They were screaming, cursing, vandalizing. My grandparents secretly signaled me inside the back way, then glumly told me how the crowd were parents of the children who got food poisoning after attending Riverside School summer camp. The problem was, the food was provided by my grandparents' farm, and now the school is threatening to file a lawsuit and doesn't seem to be open for negotiation. That can't be. There must be a solution for this. So gathering up my courage, I knocked on the principal's door. Do I know you? Um, I don't think so, ma'am. I'm Mia Jones, granddaughter of Mr. Peterson, the rancher. Wait, Mia Jones from New York? Hmm, come in. The woman must have been Mrs. Robinson, the principal's wife. But does she know me? As soon as we sat down, she said, I will withdraw the charges for you. Oh, ma'am, really? I knew we could sort this out amicably. Oh, but my sweet child, I don't do charity. I know what you're capable of, so I will only drop the lawsuit if you make my daughter the top student at school. In other words, you'll exchange all test results with her. What do you think? What do I think? I think that's a crazy proposition. But if I didn't do this, then the form would go under. So, with a reluctant nod, I agreed. Then I was immediately taken to meet her daughter. I was expecting someone snooty and spoiled, but to my surprise, this super smiley girl greeted me. Hey, I'm Eliana, but just call me Al. I'm so sorry about my mom. She's got it into her head that I need to excel at school, since my dad is the principal. Al hesitated for a bit, then continued. Also, there's Nora, the super smart daughter of my dad's ex. Mom doesn't want me to suck and dad to favor this other girl over me, so... Thinking about it, my main purpose for coming here was to complete my astronomical research. I don't need any more A, so I smiled at Elle. Don't worry, I'll make sure you're the star student in no time. The next morning, I went to school with Elle, and wow, it looked so ancient and calm. Definitely distinctive from my stuffy school in New York. Elle introduced me to her friends, and they all seemed really welcoming. It's gonna be great here. 
Still holding the deal, I helped Elle answer the teacher's questions, exchanged assignments and homework with her, and soon, Elle had already climbed up to the top rank. On the contrary, I was at the bottom of the class. Oh wow, Elle's mom really wasn't kidding when she said her grades were bad. But that didn't matter to me anyway, because the only thing I care about is this amazing astronomy tower. Talk about heaven! What are you doing here? I turned around to see Nora, the girl Elle had mentioned before, who is also the astronomy club's president. Hi, I'm Mia. I want to be part of your team. I have experience in studying astronomy and... Stop blabbering. Your grades suck and we have a strict no idiots allowed policy. I told Nora to at least give me a chance to prove myself, so she sat me down and sniggered as she handed me an astronomy test. Easy peasy, I got all the answers right in just 10 minutes. But instead of welcoming me into the club, she accused me of cheating. Ugh! Nora didn't just dislike me, she also seemed to despise Elle too. Any chance she got to call us out on something, she would definitely take it. Sir, they're cheating! I... I just want to help Mia. Please, I'm so sorry. Huh? Who was helping who? Mia, you've got a lot of nerve. Your test is suspended. The whole class was giving me disapproving looks. Being this disrespected by my peers was a new experience for me. How could Elle tell life so calmly? Great, now that I was labeled a cheater, I would never get accepted into the astronomy club ever. Mia the cheater just had to find her way to get in there then. So, I waited until dark then sneaked into the janitor's room to steal the key to the observation tower. <sighs> now I could freely study my favorite constellation without any interruptions. Montreal is close to the North Pole, so the night sky here is so clear that I could see all the stars. At this rate, my research could be done faster than expected. Then I would be out of here, leaving all of these childish rivalry dramas behind. One night, I was busy taking notes when someone opened the door and walked in. Who's there? Oh no! I hastily grabbed my papers and escaped through the emergency exit door. Who is the guy? Why is he here at this hour? The next morning, I pushed my way through the noisy crowd and saw the announcement on the school spin board. The astronomy club warned outsiders not to use the observatory room and that there would be severe punishment once the recent trespasser was discovered. Shoot, the guy from last night must have snitched on me. Turned out, the snitch was Brandon, the new transfer student, and also the grandson of the founder of Space Up. It's a shame the incredible Sir Edward Foster's grandson was such a smug jerk. But that didn't stop all the girls from going cuckoo crazy for this Brandon guy. The ironic thing is, he kept on coming over to me and talking about astronomy. Huh? Doesn't everyone here see me as an insignificant kid? Is this yours? Brandon said while holding out a piece of paper. Oh. My. This was part of my astronomy research. Did I drop it in the tower that night? But how did Brandon know it was mine? Flustered, I quickly made an excuse and left. I couldn't stop worrying about Brandon finding out I was the one who used the observatory room. If anyone knows about it, it'd be an instant suspension. I was busy thinking when suddenly the whole class burst into applause. As it turned out, they were praising my excellent essay on constellations. Well, it's known as Elle's essay now. Then the teacher turned to read the class's worst essay. My favorite star is Justin Bieber. Every time I see him, I think if only he was my husband. Everyone started laughing. <sighs> no prize for guessing whose name was on this one. Mia, I suggest you learn something from your friend Elle. I turned to look at Elle and saw her smug face. She even joined in with the others to make fun of me. Was she really that stupid to write that essay? Or did she intend to embarrass me? When I got home, Elle was already waiting on the porch to apologize to me. I helped you as promised. Shouldn't your mom keep her promise too? Get the lawsuit dismissed now. Then I'll help you finish your final exam successfully. Else, I'm not doing it. She's on it, Mia. Don't worry. I know you're leaving after a year anyway, and I also know that you're the one who snuck into the observatory. So, if you want to leave peacefully, at least help me and Brandon to get together. You and Brandon? But what does it have to do with me? Elle then told me that Brandon was so impressed by her astronomy essay that he asked her out to discuss it further. But of course, she knew nothing about it, so she had a plan. I'll have my AirPod on, and you gotta stay on the line with me throughout the date so you could tell me the answers to his questions. If we become official, I'll buy you that telescope you bang on about so much. You know, that thingy-majiggy. 
Celestron! Celestron Telescope! Oh man, she really knew my weak spot. Alright then, we have a deal. That weekend, Elle and Brandon went for a walk in Jerry Park while I stayed at home eavesdropping on their conversation through the phone. I see you have a passion for the Astros. So why didn't you join the astronomy club? Just cause I'm busy with my studies, and I also have piano practice, you know. Really? Oh, in the paper, you mentioned the black hole Sagittarius A. You seem to have done a lot of research about it. Could you tell me more? Although Elle seemed frantic having me put words in her mouth, everything went pretty smoothly. Only one thing, the more Brandon and I talked, the more I realized we had so much in common. Even if it was through Elle, I still felt a connection with him. I thought everything was going well between them, but no. One day, Elle came to me in a fit of anger and said Brandon had turned down her love confession. I want you to go talk to him and figure out why. I need to know the reason. What? Why don't you just ask him? Because I'm me, Eliana Robinson. I don't ask such embarrassing questions. So I was the one who had to make the embarrassing move? Also, call me. I want to hear it myself. Gosh, this bossy girl. And so I had to drag Brandon to the quiet rooftop while my phone was secretly on a call with Elle so she could follow the conversation. Okay, let's get straight to the point. Why did you reject Elle? Um, because I like someone else? If you already like someone else, then why hang out with her? Because only when I go out with Elle, I can talk to the person I like. It's disappointing though, why don't you recognize me? I quickly ended the call hoping Elle didn't understand what was going on. He already knew I was behind Elle's words all this time? It turned out Brandon had met me once in the city's ranking contest for students in 6th grade, in which I surpassed him and won the first prize. He'd never met a kid smarter than him in astronomy before, so when he saw me again at school, he instantly recognized me. Only, he couldn't understand why my score was so low. Brandon wanted to talk to me, but he said that all he received was a cold shoulder. I felt a bit guilty, but it's all because he told the school administration I snuck into the astronomy room. But it turned out Nora was the one who reported me. Nora was there at the time too. By the way, why do you have to do Elle's homework? I told Brandon about my contract with Mrs. Robinson and apologized for not thinking about his feelings when I agreed to be behind his and Elle's date. I see. Follow me. There's something you should know. Brandon took me to see Nora. She didn't welcome me at first, but when Brandon told her about my secret, Nora immediately changed her attitude. I should've known. Someone like Elle couldn't make such progress. She and her mom are deceiving everyone again. Then, Nora told me how she was secretly investigating the food poisoning case because, on the day of summer camp, she saw Mrs. Robinson and Elle doing something shady in the school kitchen. Why should I trust you? Elle told me that you have it in for her. So maybe you're just trying to ruin her life. <sighs> Please, why do I have to do that? Believe it or not, your precious best friend is trying to embarrass you in front of the whole school. What is this? In the lecture hall, Elle was sitting in front of a screen which said, Mia's grandpa poisoned us? We rushed to the lecture hall to find her there, telling people that my grandparents were the ones that catered spoiled food. And that I had no shame copying her works, cheating many times, and even stealing Brandon from her while they were dating. So she must have figured out that Brandon liked me, huh? Even so, why didn't she talk to me directly? How dare she make things up about me and my family? Before I could do anything, Brandon changed what was on the screen to a video of me winning the Young Minds Intelligence Contest. Everybody started buzzing when they recognized who I was. Someone even spoke loudly. I watched that show. Is that really Mia? Elle's face turned pale as people started doubting her. Then Nora snatched the mic from Elle's hand and said, So, now we've made it clear that Mia isn't dumb at all. Then what about the poisoning at the camp? Did anyone find it strange how only Elle and her mother showed no sign of poisoned symptoms that day? That's cause they were the ones who poisoned the food and blamed it on Mia's grandparents. The screen continued to show a clip of Elle's mom looking shady as she spoke to some man. She did all that just to ruin Mia's grandparents' good reputation. Then she would hire this man to buy the farm on her behalf for a ridiculously low price. What did you say? Oh my god, the principal has been standing at the door and witnessed everything. Everyone, out! When there were only four of us left in the room, Elle furiously shouted, How dare you! You're just the outcome of your cheater mom, remember? 
don't play dumb with me. You're well aware that my mom didn't cheat on Mr. Robinson, and that your mom is the one who lied to him to ruin his and my mom's wedding. And then what? Lying again that you're his daughter to force him to stay with her? You and your mom are awful people. Mr. Robinson stood in between them and stopped the argument. Oh, he didn't look too well either. Turns out, he already knew Nora's mom was wrongfully framed and didn't cheat on him at all. And that's why he always tried to make it up to Nora. But learning that Elle wasn't his daughter was one big bombshell. After knowing what his wife and daughter did, he decided to resign. He made amends with Nora's mom and they're giving it another go. After the truth came out, Elle and her mom left without a trace. I say, good riddance to bad news. My grandparents were cleared of the food poisoning allegations and now their business is booming again. With Brandon and Nora's help, I collected enough data and finished my assignment with flying colors. Now to quit high school and pursue my dreams. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just going on a short trip to Mont Megantic National Park to see the northern lights with Brandon and Nora. I've decided to stay and finish high school here so I can continue pursuing my passion for astronomy with my two... This view of the Alps is magnificent. Wow, I've never felt this free before. <sighs> huh? Hang on. Are those meowing sounds that I'm hearing? I followed the sounds to the raging river nearby, and there, stuck on a rock in the middle of it, was a terrified cat. Oh no, poor baby. I've got to help it. I quickly grabbed onto the nearby tree, then leaned out towards the rock with an opened umbrella on the other hand for the cat to jump onto. The cat hesitated for a bit before making the leap, but it's heavier than I expected. I lost my balance and tumbled into the river. I grabbed the cat just in time, but the strong current made it impossible to float. In a panic, I screamed for help, but the waves lapped over me and gulps of water filled my mouth. And just like that, I felt my surroundings darken. Ugh, what was this wet, scratchy thing rubbing on my face? I opened my eyes to see that cat sitting on me. Thank goodness it was okay, but... Where am I? This seemed like some kind of rustic cottage house. Suddenly, a man walked into the room with a food tray. H who are you? Relax, I'm the one who jumped into the river to rescue you both. Turns out, he happened to pass by the river while we were swallowed by the current, and he didn't hesitate to jump in to save us, then brought us back to his home. Oh, um, thank you. For everything. Sure. Here, eat up. So, how come you and Topaz fell into the waterway? Who? Oh, you mean the cat? How come you know his name? It says it right here. See? I'm guessing this is not your cat, then? I told him how I accidentally found Topaz, so its family must live around here somewhere. Hearing this, he agreed to help me find Topaz's owner the next day. He even gave me his bed for the night, then walked out saying he'd sleep on the couch. But as a guest, I couldn't let him do that, so I just grabbed the blanket and went to sit next to him. You have a cool tattoo there. Kinda looks like a mini Mars, right? Nah, it's my birthmark. The only thing my parents left me. Hans then told me that he grew up not having a clue who his parents were or why they abandoned him. At 18, he moved out of his foster home and came here to become an herbalist. <sighs> I felt so bad for him, and in a way, I could relate. Being alone is difficult, but having both mom and dad won't guarantee your happiness. I was born into a well-off family with both of my parents, but the thing was, they only got together due to an arranged marriage, and they have resented each other ever since. My house always felt so cold and empty, and I hated staying there. So, as soon as I graduated high school, I took a gap year to travel the world. Actually, Switzerland is my first stop. Gotta say, it's nice to have someone to talk to like this. I guess Hans felt the same way by this look he gave me. He seemed very touched. The next morning, we took Topaz to the town to ask around. Turned out, today was their annual festival, so a horde of people crammed along the street to celebrate and watch the parade. Hans held my hand so I didn't get lost, but somehow the crowd still pulled me away and I ended up stuck among these sweaty people. Suddenly, a hand grabbed mine and led me out of there. Phew. <sighs> Thank God, I couldn't breathe in there. And you know what? A super handsome, stylish guy was standing in front of me. Are you okay? That's when I noticed the tail of my shirt was ripped. Freaked out, I tried to cover it up, so he took out a silk scarf and tied it around my waist. For a second there, I froze to the spot, 
so amazed by his thoughtfulness. Just at that moment, my phone buzzed with a call from Hans. He told me to meet him at the fountain. Um, slight problem? I had no idea where that was. Well, lucky me, this gallant guy offered to take me there. We talked along the way, and I found out his name's Willard. He lives in a nearby town and was here for the festival. I told him I came to find the owner of the lost cat I'd found. Then, when I showed him the picture of Topaz, he couldn't hide his shock. Are you sure this is the cat you found? I nodded. He stayed silent for a while, then said, I might know its owner, but I gotta go now. Bring the cat to meet me there. Faye, it was nice meeting you. Then he bowed down to kiss the back of my hand before he left. How sweet. I watched as he disappeared into the crowd. Thanks to Topaz, I got the chance to meet him again. Uh, why are you making that funny face? I told him about my encounter with Willard and convinced him to come with me to the address on the handkerchief. He seemed skeptical at first, but then gave in. I mean, other than this, we had no clue. It was worth a shot, right? The next day, we went to the place Willard told us. But, seriously? Is this right? Why were there a line of people all holding near-on identical cats to Topaz? They even had the same collar as him. What is going on? I walked over to ask an old man sitting on a bench. He told me the millionaire lady who lives here had lost her dearest cat, Topaz. People said his name was on the top of her inheritance list, and she promised to greatly reward anyone who safely returned him, so these frauds were trying to deceive the owner by bringing some Topaz lookalike here. But Madame Primrose is no fool. Huh? Madame Primrose? The iconic designer and president of Wisteria Fashion Corp? That's right. Oh my god! I immediately dragged Hans to stand in the line. You see, my childhood dream was to become a fashion designer, and, of course, the one I admired the most was none other than Madame Primrose! Ah! One of the reasons I came to Switzerland was to find her and hopefully become her apprentice. And now look, what are the odds? Finally, it was our turn, but... I'm gonna have to stop you right there. All right, everyone, listen up. Madame Primrose won't accept any toe passes from now on as she's tired of your deceit. So, disperse. What? We didn't just wait half a day here for nothing. Fine, I'll find another way to get in. We then walked around the mansion and found its side gate. Then, just when we were climbing over it, a maid caught us. But she didn't make a fuss out of it. Instead, she seemed a bit flirty towards Hans. Ooh, I had an idea. There's our chance. You go and charm her. He seemed confused at first, but then got the point. Hey, I think you're really cute. Hans then tried his best at flirting, and as soon as she swooned, I asked her to help us return Topaz to his owner. The maid hesitated at first, but when we said that we didn't need to be repaid or anything, she agreed to let us in. We quickly split up to find Madame Primrose. I wandered the maze-like hallways. Then I suddenly bumped into someone. Mind your way! Wait, I don't know you. What are you doing here? I, uh, um... She's my new friend. Is there a problem? I'm sorry, young master. It was Willard. He came to rescue me again. Great to see you again, young master Willard. You live here? Why didn't you call me when you arrived? Did you bring the cat? Where is it? Give it to me right now. Willard, calm down. Topaz is safe. I just found out his owner is Madame Primrose and- I'm her grandson. Just give the cat to me now. His agitated behavior didn't seem right. I took a few steps back from him, refused to do what he said, then ran. You don't understand. Just at that moment, Hans and Madame Primrose appeared. There you are. Are you okay? He worriedly asked. But boy, all I could see right now was Madame Primrose. She approached me, held my hand, and repeatedly thanked me for risking my life to rescue Topaz. This was amazing, but... Hmm, but why did Willard just leave without saying anything? Madame Primrose invited us to stay for dinner that evening. Joining us were Willard and his mom, Agneta. Madame then told me how much Topaz meant to her. Twenty years ago, she lost her son, Mr. Alvarez, to a car accident. Then a year later, her grandson Leroy disappeared. Her grief was almost unbearable, but then she was gifted a cat, Topaz, and thanks to him, she began to heal. I tried comforting her by saying she still had Willard, her other amazing grandson with an excellent fashion sense, inherited from his grandma. 
but to my surprise, Madam Primrose said Willard isn't her real grandson since Agnetta is actually Mr. Alvarez's second wife and was a stepmom to the missing grandson, Leroy, and Willard was her son with her ex-husband. I could see Willard and his mom were feeling so uncomfortable. Willard must have felt so hurt as Madam Primrose never even thought of him as a family member. Then my train of thought was interrupted by Hans. Ugh, why didn't he just tell me to pass him the salt instead of sticking his right arm to my face like this? Suddenly, Agnetta gave him a mortified look and spilled wine all over the table. Mom, are you okay? She didn't reply, but just left. I could tell it was because she saw Hans's birthmark. What could this be? Has she no manners? She must be unwell. I'll go check on her. So I followed her to the garden gazebo. That's where I heard her talking to someone on the phone. You had one simple job. Take that pampered moggy miles away. Well, guess what? It came back. I gasped in shock, and right then, a hand covered my mouth. Shh. Be quiet. Oh, but it gets worse. The stupid cat brought Leroy, the missing grandson, home. That's right. I saw that Mars birthmark with my own eyes. If Primrose finds out about this, we're done. You hear me? Wait, so Leroy, Madam Primrose's only grandchild, is actually Hans. Uh, and... His stepmom was the one who secretly gave him away in the first place. Even worse, I was hearing the shocking news with her son. Willard, get it together. Do you know anything about her plan? I knew mom was behind Topaz going missing. That's why I tried to take the cat away earlier, to keep him safe from her. But, but Leroy too? That was just heartless. What should I do now? She's my mom, after all. I could see his pure and kind soul being tormented, and my heart ached for him. I know it must be hard, but you need to tell Madame Primrose the truth and make things right. That's a way to help your mom redeem herself, okay? He stared at me with those dreamy eyes of his, and I felt my heart turn to mush. But a phone call from Hans interrupted us. He was looking for me, saying we gotta go. Right, I had to tell him the truth. In a cab back to Hans's cottage, I told him everything, and he just burst out laughing, saying, <laughs> I'm Leroy, the heir of a millionaire. Oh, please. <laughs> I'm serious. You were brought to the foster home exactly 19 years ago, and you both have this one-of-a-kind birthmark. Okay, so what if I'm really her grandson? I don't even know her, and I'm definitely not rich kid material. You've been lonely your entire life. This is your chance to find the family you've always wanted. Hans was speechless. It seemed I'd hit his weak spot, and he finally agreed. We asked the driver to take us back to the mansion. But no one was awake at that hour except a gardener. He led us to a library deep into the mansion, brought out tea, and told us to wait. Just a few minutes later, Hans started coughing, and his face swelled up. Oh no, he must have been allergic to something in the tea! Panicked, I screamed for help, and the gardener came back and carried Hans to the car. But then a hand muzzled me from behind, and everything went dark! I woke up with my head pounding and unable to move. As I tried to make sense of the situation, I realized I was tied to a chair, mouth taped, surrounded by some rusty, unsanitary medical tools. And on the other side of the room, Hans was unconscious and tied to a patient's bed. Standing next to him was Agnetta and the gardener and a guy in a blouse with some kinds of tools in his hand, about to do something to Hans's birthmark. I tried to scream and struggled to break free, but I couldn't move an inch. Right at that moment, Willard barged in. Stop this. Leave right now or I'll call the cops for your unlicensed business. And mom, I already know everything, so please have some remorse. Agnetta looked so ashamed of herself. Willard, everything I did, I did it for you. Please understand. You saw how that old hag Primrose treated me. I was so miserable. Then your dad offered to help me. Dad? You mean Tim? How can he be my dad? Don't be such a wimp, son. I stayed and worked here like a servant just to be close to you. We did all this so you can be the only heir. You deserve that. Now finish it. I... I can't, Tim. Get away from my mom, you dirtbag. You never cared about me. You only moved here to manipulate her to do your dirty work. A terrible person like you will never be my dad. Then I'll do it. As he was about to lay hands on Hans, suddenly there was a meowing sound and Topaz appeared, followed by Madame Primrose. Step away from my grandson. 
You dared to live under my roof all this time and play foul tricks on my family? Take him away. Luckily, Hans came round, and he had a tearful reunion with his grandma. They finally had the closure they deserved. Hans decided to stay in the mansion with his long-lost family. He's even planted an herbal garden there for treating and healing people, as he always wished. Madame Primrose had finally found peace, as now she had both her beloved grandson and precious cat back. She also thought that maybe she'd been too strict on Agneta, so she decided not to press any charges against her. Agneta had also apologized, but she felt too full of shame to stay and decided to move out of the mansion. Willard followed his mom and helped her start a new life. What about me? Well, I got the thing I've always dreamt of, to be Madame Primrose's apprentice. That's her gift to me for bringing both her cat and her grandson back. And, right now, I'm late for a date with a very special guy. Can you guess who it is? Wow, it's been a busy day at the salon. What can I say? It's all thanks to my top-notch hairstyling talent. Ta-da! What did you do to my hair? Platinum blonde is the current trend, ma'am. I- I asked for brown! How can I go to school looking like this? Ugh, she has no eye for beauty. <sighs> but, oh no, this dumb machine? <sighs> At least it's not completely burned. Were you dosing off while cutting my hair? Give us our money back, now! Money? I've only worked here for a week. How am I supposed to pay them back? Ask my parents? No way. I, the beautiful Olivia, had declared in front of them that I hated school and would build my own career through my passion for hairstyling, not with any of those boring books. So, I left my hometown and got a job at this fancy hair salon in the big city. I would prove to my parents that I could actually earn money with my talent. Ugh! But now my boss was going berserk at me. Oh, dearie me. There's no need to make a fuss over such a measly amount of money. I shall pay for it on her behalf. I turned around and, wow, it was this graceful-looking middle-aged woman. Her outfit, hairstyle, and manners all screamed elegance and luxury. Pretty girl, I can see that you have a keen eye for beauty. The only thing you're missing is an experienced mentor's guidance. And I happen to know someone. I can't believe it. Mr. Fullington, the world's number one hairstylist, was going to be my mentor. Of course, it's all thanks to this awesome lady. Oh, wait. Mom. I should call her mom now, as she's just adopted me. She must have taken a liking to me seeing how determined I was, pursuing my passion despite all hardship. She and her husband are millionaires who couldn't have children, so yeah, they decided to take me in. Man, this is the best thing to happen to me ever. Olivia, school isn't the only way to success. With your talent, the road can be much shorter. My foster parents are so kind. Just look at this room. I feel like a princess. Just look at this gigantic bed, satin sheets, and walk-in closet. Better still, they even arranged for a makeup artist and a stylist to spend all day helping me look fabulous. The rich kid's life sure was sweet. I was so immersed in all of it that I almost forgot the main reason why I agreed to do this. The hairstyling course with Mr. Fullington. Mom, Dad, I know that you're both very busy, but I've been waiting so long. Has Mr. Fullington forgot about our appointment? Oh, sweetie, I'm sorry, but he's been sick, so his schedule has all been put off till next month. Don't worry, darling. In the meantime, why don't you try attending some fancy parties on our behalf? It's a good chance to expand your social circle and learn how to make money from all the best. Oh, that sounds pretty good. If I could make lots of money, then my parents would have to take me seriously and stop their stupid go-back-to-school demands. As soon as I arrived at the party, all these new friends gathered around and complimented on how beautiful I looked. The rich guys went crazy for me, too. I instantly became the center of attention. This one guy called Bruce introduced himself as the son of the CEO to the top media corporation in the U.S. Olivia, that exquisite face of yours was made for the big screen. You should play the leading role in our new movie. Oh, acting? I'd never thought about it before. Hmm... Walking down the red carpet and posing in front of hundreds of cameras did sound appealing. It's worth a try, right? I was still stunned at Bruce's offer when I felt something cool on my finger. Oh my gosh, a sparkly red diamond ring? William, heir to the Geogems Limited. Pleasure to meet you, Olivia. 
Please consider this my greeting gift. And this continued all evening, until I couldn't hold any more stuff. Flowers from Justin, a jewelry set from Andrew, a perfume collection from Antony, and this watch from... Jeez, I couldn't remember anymore. I was trying to slip away when a handsome guy blocked me. You're stunning, Olivia. Can I see you tomorrow? A date? I didn't even know him. No, no. What a pity. I'm meeting my old friends at West High tomorrow. Sorry, it's not that I'm picky or anything, but dating can't be that easy, right? Phew, finally home. What an eventful evening. Just then, I got a call from Minnie, my best friend. Minnie told me that some mean girls at school were spreading rumors that I stole money from my parents, then packed up and ran away. Okay then, let them tittle-tattle. Tomorrow, I'll show those meanies who's the real deal. Yay, it's so nice to see Minnie again. We immediately chatted non-stop about all kinds of things. Then suddenly, the hyenas appeared with the same sarcastic tone as usual. Wow, counterfeit goods are so well made these days. You know, your supposedly Birkin bag is extremely rare. There's only five of those on Earth, right? Busted! How much do supercar hourly rentals and bodyguards cost nowadays, little miss show-off? Minnie was going to defend me, but I stopped her. No need to waste time arguing with these people. <laughs> I then grasped Minnie's hand to leave, but... Look! Olivia! I looked up. There was an airplane flying at very close range, and it was writing something? O. L. I. V. The white smoke actually spelled out my name. I've only seen this in movies. I gasped in shock as the plane landed, and stepping out of the cockpit was the guy at the party last night, Nathan. Turns out he was the youngest pilot in America and wanted to impress me with this grand gesture after being rejected yesterday. Flying in the sky is my passion. And Olivia... I want to be your personal pilot, taking you wherever you want. Oh my goodness, I don't know what was better. Having a rich, handsome guy going out of his way to impress me, or seeing the astonished looks on my fake friends' faces. <sighs> Such thrilling days like this should have made me happy, right? But sitting among this mountain of expensive gifts, I couldn't shake this uneasy feeling. Being the center of smitten eyes and receiving countless compliments and gifts was cool and all, but... Minnie's words awakened me. Olivia, do you think they really are generous enough to give you all this without asking for anything in return? No, I shouldn't accept these pricey items. I was putting them all back in their boxes to return them when my foster mom walked in. Oh no, darling. Returning gifts is considered very insulting in our society. <sighs> the world of the rich is so complicated. So I listened to her and dismissed the idea of returning those presents. But I should still return the favor, right? So I agreed to meet some of them. The first person must be the one who impressed me the most, Nathan the pilot. His airplane hangar was where we had our first date. I couldn't find anything bad about Nathan, but we just didn't click. He kept on rambling about planes, which model each was, how hard it was for him to get them, blah, blah, blah. While I had no interest in any of this. The next guy, William, was even worse. He not only invited me, but also dozens of other beautiful girls. He even gave each girl a gemstone from his collection. A true player, so obviously a skip. Bruce was easier to talk to, but I soon realized that he had a problem. This set of glassware was custom made by the most skillful craftsman in Switzerland. It's yours if you like. Oh, wait, I'll have someone bring them over later. Look at this beautiful painting. Wouldn't it be perfect in your bedroom? Ah, but it's too big for you to carry home. I'll send it over later. What about my leading role in the movie you mentioned? <laughs> I almost forgot. But, Olivia, acting is not as easy as you think. Besides, the entertainment industry is really toxic. Please just be my princess, okay? See? He kept promising me the world and then... Nothing. What a boastful, stingy liar. I didn't like any of these guys, so I must return their expensive gifts. But as soon as I carried the boxes out of the room, my foster mom stopped me. My silly Olivia, why are you so concerned about this? To them, these things are merely a drop in the ocean. But if you feel uncomfortable, I'll keep them out of sight for you. Giving them back will bring shame to our family. And you don't want that, do you? 
All right, that seemed like the best solution. My foster parents had been so nice to me, I shouldn't cause them any trouble. But a few days later, I discovered that they had secretly used my phone to ask Bruce for more presents. He thought I was angry, so he promised me a huge surprise tomorrow. It's weird. Why did they do that? They're as rich as Bruce's family, aren't they? I asked them why, and turned out my foster parents just wanted to test Bruce, as he seemed to be the most persistent in pursuing me, but had not shown his sincerity. Early next morning, I received a call from Bruce, saying that he'd sent someone over with a luxurious car, and reminded me about our date tonight. Wait, an entire car? That's too much this time! I was about to tell him to keep it when my foster father rushed in, saying that my parents were seriously ill. Oh gosh. I quickly hung up the phone and immediately went back to my hometown. Dear God, please protect my parents. Surprisingly, my mom opened the door looking perfectly fine, and there was Dad as healthy as can be watching TV. Ah, <sighs> thank goodness. My foster dad must have made a mistake. It's been a while since I was home, so I decided to stay the night. And as we were having some family time, I got another call from Bruce. Oh no, I forgot to cancel our date, and now he's at the mansion waiting for me. The problem was, Bruce couldn't find his sports car anywhere, and kept on making a fuss about it. I tried calling my foster parents to resolve this, but I couldn't contact them the whole evening. The morning after, I returned to the mansion to find strangers going in and out. Um, what are you all doing? Hi, we're moving in. Great to meet you, neighbor. It's such a catch to find a good place like this up for rent at reasonable prices. Right in the local newspaper, am I right? For rent? No, no, no. What on earth is going on? I rushed into my foster parents' bedroom, but it was empty. Even the gifts they said they'd keep for me were all gone. They left without a trace, as if they were running away. What? Did your partners in crime leave you? Now don't you dare deny it, you fraud. What did he say? Partners in crime? Fraud? I tried explaining to him how I wanted to return all the gifts I received, but he wouldn't believe me. He threatened to call the cops if he didn't get his car back. Oh no, no way that's gonna happen. All I could do was beg Bruce to give me some time. This is the home of our town's famous sheriff. He's the only person who could help me, but all I got was, I'm sorry, but I'm retired. You're gonna have to ask someone else. What to do now? I was freaking out when, out of nowhere, no need for my dad. This is a piece of cake. I can give you a hand. I turned around to see a guy leaning on the door with a cold, arrogant look, and his arms crossed. Who is this guy? Can he really help me? We'll see. Wow, Alan really took the risk and invested a lot in this. A sports car, a mansion, expensive trips, and even this huge event. I have to admit, he looks quite handsome being all dressed up. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Alan, yep, the sheriff's son, is playing the rich heir of a big corporation chasing after a beautiful young lady, which is me. However, I didn't expect things would turn out so real. Alan's pursuit of me even made it on the local news. You guys must be curious how someone who's not a millionaire did this. Well, Alan convinced Bruce to fund our plan. He was hesitant at first, but he soon realized that this was the only way to catch the frauds and get his stuff back, so reluctantly he agreed. Alan is indeed a genius, and his well-thought-out strategy quickly got the fish hooked. We were making headlines everywhere, and I finally received a text from my so-called foster mom. At first, she was just asking how I was doing, and talked about how busy they were with overseas projects, until today. Olivia, how's it going with that mysterious millionaire boyfriend of yours? He seems willing to give you anything. So you will consider him, won't you, darling? As expected, these money-hungry crooks wouldn't let it slide once they heard millionaire. So I replied to her that my rich man was treating me well and wanted to throw an extravagant feast this weekend to officially announce our relationship. And I hoped my parents could put off their business trip and come join us. Tonight was the night. Gosh, I was so nervous, as my mom didn't reply to that message of mine. Will they show up, or did they sense something was off? While I was super nervous, Alan came to me and held my hand real tight. Don't worry, Olivia. Everything will work out as planned. My, my. What is this feeling? 
It's undeniable that I always feel so safe being with Alan. The party finally began. Alan proposed to me with this rare, precious, surrendered by gem on a ring, which is one of the only three existing in the whole world. Everyone started buzzing. Alan's acting was so perfect, from his eye contact to the words he said, that I couldn't help but feel butterflies in my stomach. I... I do. When the party was over and all the guests left, I received a call from my foster mom telling me to go to the back gate. As predicted, they offered to keep the engagement ring for me. Drop the act, frauds! The two were still processing what was happening when the cops barged in and arrested them. It worked! Can't believe I've successfully tricked these notorious scammers! <laughs> what about my car? My Bugatti? Where is it? Oh, I almost forgot the main sponsor for this perfect plan. Without him, we definitely couldn't pull this off. Our stingy millionaire, Bruce Dillon. I bet there hasn't been a single day gone by that he didn't think about his missing gifts, huh? <laughs> that reminds me. This sparkling, precious ring, too. I quickly took it off, passed it to Alan, and told him to give it back to Bruce. But the minute the surrenderbite ring left my finger, Alan put on something else. Oh my god, another ring? Your role as a millionaire's girlfriend may be over, but will you be a girlfriend to an ordinary guy like me, Olivia? Yes! A million times yes! After all this mess, I now realize that I've still got a lot of learning to do. So I've decided to listen to my parents and finish school. Turns out, if I really paid attention in class, it's actually pretty interesting. And Minnie is still my amazing BFF who let me have free reign to experiment on her hair. And, of course, this cute future detective, too. Babe, time to change your hairstyle. It's not here. Not there, either. Where can it be? It's not just any shirt. It's my most prized possession. It has Kendall Jenner, my idol's autograph on it. Franny, your t-shirt was dirty, so I cleaned it for you. Come have a look. Oh, snap. I rushed over to see my precious shirt neatly piled on top of the fresh laundry. No, 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 no. The autograph's completely gone. Grandma! That's right. The person responsible for this unwanted blank shirt is my grandma, who just moved in with us after Granddad passed away. At first, it seemed exciting because my memories about Grandma were all from my happy childhood with her. But now I'm taking it back. She's a literal disaster. You know what? She is getting on in years, but still wants to learn to use social media. My mom even bought her a brand new iPhone 14. Meanwhile, her dear daughter was stuck with this lame iPhone 8. <sighs> Honestly, all she needed was just one of those brick phones that can only take calls. With her forgetfulness, she'll forget all her passwords. So it's best to just log in with my iCloud. After all, this phone will become mine anyway. Oh, that's quite a handsome young man. You think so too? Indeed, Josh's attractiveness is second to none. He's every girl's dream man. And yours as well, right? As if I stood a chance. He's notoriously cold, and none of the girls from school seem to interest him. Well, that probably was the only time we shared the same thought. Otherwise, we're always arguing about all kinds of things, especially the way I dress. She didn't even bother asking me before sewing up all my favorite ripped jeans and then left a dress that she'd made on my bed with a note. This adorable dress will suit you much better. I used to love her handmade dresses when I was five, but who even wears anything like this these days? That's not all. She nagged me all the time for straightening my hair instead of keeping it naturally frizzy, since it's supposedly cuter. And guess what? It's actually her who I'd inherited my natural hair from. Bet she didn't know it was the reason I had to grow up with my classmates saying stuff like, you're actually quite pretty, but it's a shame about the hair. And how come you don't have straight hair like your parents? Are you adopted? Those hurtful words made me hate my hair with a passion and wish for beautiful, smooth, straight hair like Kendall Jenner's. So of course, I'll keep straightening it every day, no matter what grandma says. Thankfully, those complaints will finally come to an end tomorrow as I'm going back to school after summer break. Yay! Huh? What's everyone buzzing about? At that moment, the teacher walked in and announced that our class will have a very special new student. And then, a very familiar figure entered my class. It was... my grandma? What on earth? Did she get lost on her way to bingo or what? How humiliating! 
Maybe if I stayed deadly still, she wouldn't spot me, and no one would know it was my granny. Oh, my sweetie pie, you forgot your orange juice. All eyes were on me. Good grief. Someone help me disappear from this planet, please. After class, I had to sneak out as fast as I could to avoid having lunch with my grandma. But my best friend Lloyd wouldn't quit teasing me. Suddenly, I heard someone laughing loudly across the room. Grandma? But who is she sitting with? Wow, Joe has quite a peculiar taste in women. He ignores every single girl in this school, but is now completely smitten over your granny. Jeez, why is she bothering him? Joe must have felt uncomfortable. I quickly went over there, apologized, and pulled my grandma away. On the way home from school, my grandma recounted her day just like a little kid would. Do you know that they have vending machines in the hallway with all kinds of snacks? That's genius! And oh my, the campus is big. I almost wet myself while searching for the restroom. <laughs> Tell me which part of this is funny again? It only proves that someone her age belongs in a nursing home, not a high school. I needed to talk to mom. So when she was finally alone in the kitchen, I immediately asked her, how exactly did grandma end up in my class? It turned out that when my parents invited grandma to live with us, she told them she would, but only if she could go to school. I think it's a lovely idea. It means she won't be lonely at home all day, as you'll keep her company. Besides, she spent her whole life taking care of our family, so it's our turn to look after her, right? Yeah, I suppose Mum raised some valid points. But who knew that Grandma could turn my school life upside down like this? She clung to me all day, ate whatever I ate, listened to the music I listened to, and even hung out with my friends. Worse still, she told them all embarrassing childhood stories about me. How I used to eat toothpaste because the ad said it was edible, and how I incubated eggs myself to see if I could hatch a chick. But that's not the worst part. She broke my hair straightener, so now I'm stuck wearing this stupid hat. How annoying. Hey, hey, breaking news. What is it this time? Jose has found the girl of his dreams, and she's here at our school. No way. No girls have caught his eye before. Why now? Ah, uh, Franny, what on earth? I looked down and, oops, I just accidentally turned him into Sully from Monsters, Inc. Sorry, my bad. Okay, let me see. As Lloyd told me, this was the girl Jose got to know through Tinder before she mysteriously vanished. Moore, 17 years old, goes to my school and... Wait, she only has this picture? All I could see was her frizzy brown hair. Out of nowhere, someone snatched my hat. That must be Lloyd trying to get back at me for the paint job earlier. I tried to grumble at him, but only saw Grandma with my hat in her hand. Franny, your hair is so beautiful. Why cover it up? And also, these clothes. The dress I made for you goes far better with your hair. Enough. There's no way I'd let anyone see me with this hideous hair and granny outfit. Please, Grandma. Leave me alone and don't cause me any more trouble. This is my school and having you around is embarrassing. She looked shocked and was about to say something, but just left without another word. So, it's been a week since we last talked. It seemed that I was no longer her concern as she made new friends. So it's good for both of us, right? Suddenly, I heard a deep voice behind me. Hi, Franny. Can I talk to you about something? Wait, this voice? I immediately turned around to see Joe standing there, smiling at me. Oh my, this is the first time Joe's ever asked to speak to a girl. All the envious eyes are on me. I'm the luckiest girl here. Has he finally seen my unique charm? The thing is, I happened to see your curly hair the other day, and you look quite like the girl in the picture. I wonder if you are... Oh, he didn't come here because of me. Um, sorry, but I'm not Moore. I could see the disappointment on his face. He apologized for getting the wrong person, but before leaving, he smiled and told me, By the way, you're pretty with that curly hair. Really? That frizzy hair that I've gone out of my way to hide? Can't believe someone out there, besides Granny, actually likes it. A few days later, I arrived at school to a frightening scene. Jose was hand-in-hand hand with Amy. Turns out, she had come forwards as the mysterious girl. Let's see, 17? Check. Curly brown hair? Check. And her last name is Moore. There's no mistaking it. But I kept wondering, what does Jose like about this notorious wild girl? Her clique, which now included my dear granny, are always playing dumb tricks for attention. Look, 
She's no different from a traffic light now that she's friends with them. Once, their group even turned the library into a runway. Obviously, this quickly reached the supervisor, but, well, only my grandma was slow enough to get caught. Thanks to that, she received a ticket to the principal's office and they called in... My mom! Don't you find it ridiculous that a person this age is still getting scolded by the principal? School is not the place for grandma at all. Performing art requires a bold personality, girl. I might be old, but my spirit remains youthful. You know what? I'm going to participate in the Rise to Fame contest as well. I think I may just win. I turned to my mother with begging eyes, but only received a forced smile and a just let her do what she wants. You'll lose anyway. Why bother? How about you sign up too, and we'll see who wins? Ha! Huh. Fine. Challenge accepted. I'll defeat you easily, Granny. Just wait and see. Finally, Rise to Fame, my school's annual competition, arrived. Each team of three will participate in different rounds, with the two best teams going to the final. First round, handball was a piece of cake for us. Having two sporty types on the team helped with that. As for Granny's team, which consisted of herself, Jose, and Dolly Amy, they were eliminated almost immediately. <laughs> After sports was a Sudoku round. Each team will compete against one another. Whoever solves the puzzle first wins, which should be a breeze because I used to spend rain-filled afternoons playing this game with Granny as a kid. On the other hand, Amy was complaining to the organizing committee that this round was a joke, since Sudoku was so outdated. The more she talked, the more it showed that she's terrible at math and numbers. So it'll be like taking candy from a baby, right? But I forgot Granny was on their team. And unexpectedly, Jose was also very quick-witted. It didn't take them long to solve such a difficult puzzle. Seeing them hugging and celebrating pissed me off. Losing to them by a mere second was the real stinger. Focus, Franny. We had to beat them in the countries and histories round to win. Just a few more minutes till the final round. I was about to leave the waiting room when suddenly... I heard a ding coming from this phone left on the chair. It's Grandma's phone. But, wait, she knows how to use Tinder? Curious, I opened it, and on the screen were all the messages from Jose and the mysterious Moor. Why does Grandma have this account? And why is Jose convinced Amy isn't who he's looking for? I immediately went to look for my Grandma and found her in the corner of the stage wing. But as I approached her, she pulled my hand in and signaled for me to keep silent. <laughs> I thought you let that annoying old hag join the team as a joke. Who knew she'd be so helpful? You'll win easily. Yeah, right? I even heard that history is her strength. I just need her to finish this last round, then I'll kick her out in a heartbeat. The whole group burst out laughing. I nervously turned to look at Granny, but she didn't show any sign of anger. So what will my grandma do next, you ask? As soon as the final round began, she stood up, took the mic, and announced... I want to withdraw from the competition because I will never let two-faced people get the better of me. After that, she left, and the whole audience started to make a fuss, while Amy's face turned pale. However, the real shocker was when Jose also came on stage. Me too. I don't want to be in a team with a liar. Then he walked away as Amy chased after him. The audience buzzed, and the organizers announced that this meant our team had automatically won the competition. I rushed home right after the award ceremony to find Grandma ruminating in the garden. I quietly sat down next to her and put my hand on her shoulder to console her. She looked at me, gently smiled, and started telling me stories I'd never heard before. I discovered that she fell pregnant at 16 and dropped out of school. Her friends weren't very nice to her, so she'd never resumed her education. So now she had time, she decided to go back to school to experience her lost youth. That's why, Franny, you should never let others' mean words get to you. Cherish what you have, because there are still people who love that side of you. What she said was really touching, and it reminded me of Jose's compliments on my hair. Granny, so what about the Tinder account? Oh, I know you really like Jose, so I created an account to learn more about him so I could help you. Turns out, that profile picture was Grandma when she was younger, hence the similarity to me. And Moore actually was her maiden name. I hugged her and profusely apologized for my poor behavior. She gently patted my head, smiled, and said she'd take me to a secret spot. The next day, I returned to my naturally frizzy hair and put on the dress Granny gave me. It wasn't trendy, but it fit me perfectly. And weirdly, I felt kind of confident wearing it. My grandma and I happily walked into a book cafe when I spotted Jose. 
I've brought the person you're looking for here. We both looked at her with questioning eyes. You mean, turned out there was still one thing she hadn't told me, that the alias Moore she put up on Tinder was all based on my preferences, my hobbies, my habits, my taste in music, etc. She'd been collecting everything about me to text Joes. <laughs> I had to let him know there's an interesting girl like our Franny out there, right? That was why Jost didn't feel as compatible with Amy. Then the intelligence round confirmed it, as he and the mysterious girl both had one thing in common, a passion for Sudoku. In the end, everything was cleared up. Grandma is still attending my school, and I actually don't mind it anymore. She brings in homemade cakes for me and my friends, tells us interesting stories about the old days, and gives out the best advice. Most importantly, she made me realize that being me isn't so bad, frizzy hair and all. Almost forgot. You're also wondering what happened between me and Joe's, huh? Well, I think you should see for yourself. I'm still waiting for the day my mom says, It's all fake. We're millionaires. This was just to teach you to be humble. But I know that'll never happen. And I'm still humble. But humble as in humble background. Hi, I'm Addison from Colorado. Ever since my dad passed away when I was seven, we've been broke. And mom got irked whenever I asked her for money. So going to this kind of expensive summer camp seems pretty far-fetched to me. Suddenly, somebody snatched the flyer out of my hands. It's Katie and Candace, the resident mean girls. Girls, are you ready for the trip yet? New hair, new nails, new clothes, all checked. What about you, Addie the Batty? Oops, sorry. We forgot that a poor loser like you could never afford to join in. I forced back tears as they burst out laughing, then left. Addison, are you okay? Don't listen to them. I can help. Stay away from me, Layla. Rich kids like you would never understand. I flicked her hand away and ran off. Hmm, let's see. Mom's getting ready for her night shift and didn't seem in such a bad mood. Maybe now is my chance to drop the question. Mom, I need some money for the school camp. It's the last chance to- We can barely afford the rent this month. Do you know that? Find a way to make money yourself instead of begging me, will you? At this age, and you're still so unthoughtful. Unthoughtful? Have you ever been thoughtful of me? I hate how freaking poor our family is. And more than anything else, I hate you. I ran straight to my room, packed a backpack, and quickly left the house. It's already 2 a.m., and this snowstorm is only getting worse. I ignored dozens of calls from Mom. There was no way I'd return to that house, ever. Oh, it's freezing. I rummaged through my backpack for my mittens when, oh, Alice in Wonderland, my favorite book. The most beautiful moments in my life suddenly came rushing back to me. It was when my dad read me bedtime stories every night. I'd never forgotten his gentle eyes and warm voice. As I turned the pages in hopes of distracting myself from the storm, my phone notified another call from mom. I have to tell her not to bother me anymore. Hang on, hospital? My mom had an accident at work? I quickly got on my bike to go there, but the barreling storm threw piles of snow against me. I couldn't see anything. Ah! <sighs> Is it morning already? Contrary to yesterday's blizzard, everything looks as fresh as spring now. But where am I? Suddenly a giant acorn fell and broke in half in which there was a piece of paper. Welcome to Wonderland? Am I dreaming? Wake up, Addison. Mom needs you. Stop wasting time daydreaming like this. Just then, there was a shrill scream. Intruder! Restrain her! Suddenly, two strange men in uniform grabbed my arms, forced me over to a tiny rose arch, and made me go through it. I peered around feeling awestruck. I was in a huge greenhouse, and a well-dressed man was waiting for me. Hello? I'm Edward, the King of Wonderland. Welcome to my kingdom. Dad? Is that Dad? He looked so similar to my dad that I almost blurted it out. He welcomed me warmly with a table of lavish food. I hadn't eaten since last night, so I couldn't help but dig right in. Only when the clock chimed, I became aware of reality. Mom! I needed to get to her. I immediately asked King Edward for the exit. This land is beautiful, but a monster rules its gate. I don't know how you got here. But if you want to leave, you'll have to bring that monster three valuable items. Three items? I asked. Yes. Let's see what that is. Then Sir Edward approached the glass door and spoke out loud. Mirror, mirror on the wall. 
Who is the most handsome of them all? Your Highness, you are the most handsome, the most elegant. We wish to be as perfect as you are. <laughs> yeah, if I was you, I'd want to be me too. Now tell me, in order for Addison to leave here, what are the required items? To escape this land, she must acquire one fair lock of Rapunzel's hair, the scarf of Red Riding Hood, and Aladdin's magic lamp. Complete this quest before the clock strikes midnight, or be stuck in this world for an eternity. What? Are you serious? Where am I meant to find those things? Don't worry, I'll send Arthur, my close bodyguard, to accompany you. Just then, a tall, handsome guy about my age appeared. Hey, little girl, there's no time to waste. We need to leave now. Then he threw me a set of clothes and told me to change. After that, we went through the same gate as before. Only this time, it no longer led to a red rose garden, but an underground sewer system. Ew, what are we doing down here? It stinks! Arthur didn't say a word and quickly found a staircase leading above ground. I immediately followed him, and there was a busy street right in front of me. I noticed that everyone was looking at something. It was long, blonde hair falling from a skyscraper's penthouse. Huh? Rapunzel lives in the Empire State Building? Ridiculous! We quickly walked over there, but it was guarded very strictly. How can we get in? That's why I told you to wear this. So, we easily blended in with the maids and waiters and entered the tower. Wow, I've never set foot in such a luxurious house. Who are you? Startled, I turned around to see Rapunzel in the Grimm's fairy tales, standing right in front of me. But wait, why does this girl look familiar? Layla, is that you? Oh, goodness. I knew you were rich, but I didn't expect you to live in such a beautiful house. You... you know me? I excitedly showed her our class photos. Layla seemed very interested in them, but she couldn't recall anything, and kept asking me to tell her more stories about school. When I was rambling about our friends to her, Arthur turned to me and whispered, You need to carry on the task now. Oh, it's been two hours already. I chose my words carefully to ask her for a lock of hair, and of course, she said yes. But when we were about to leave, she clung on to me. Please stay here with me. Clothes, shoes, anything here you want, I can give it to you. This one? This one also. All of this luxury stuff will all be mine? Yes, of course. Wake up. Have you forgotten what we came here for? Are you willing to give up on seeing your mother ever again for this? I'm sorry, Layla, but I really have to go. My mom's in danger. Then please take me with you. I can't stay in this hideous house anymore. Come on, you have everything on earth here. It's like heaven. No, it's hell. All this stuff is just meaningless. What I need is freedom, school, friends, and being able to do what I want. Turns out, after her parents' divorce, her dad did everything to win custody and kept her here just to make money from her gorgeous blonde hair. I miss mom. I'd rather live in a small, shabby house than this flashy, cold place. I couldn't leave her here. Suddenly, I remembered how Eugene saves Rapunzel in the movie. So after getting Layla's approval, I cut her hair short, and the three of us ran away from this penthouse. We dropped Layla off at school, where her mom was already waiting for her. The simplest things like freedom, friends, or someone who truly cares for us are much more valuable than superficial material things. Sadly, I always craved what I didn't have and took what I did have for granted. Let's go. Why are you still standing here? Huh? We have to attend the class too? Ain't no time for this. We gotta find Red Riding Hood. Without a word, Arthur just dragged me away, eventually stopping in front of a girl wearing a scarf on her head. Here she is, the person you need. I waved at her, but she just coldly looked up and asked, What do you want? Huh? Red Riding Hood was none other than Katie? Um, I'll get right to the point. I really need your red scarf. Can you excuse me? This is Gucci. Do you know how much it costs? It's from even the limited edition. Look at you. You probably don't even have a dime to your name. Yeah, it is true, but... I really need this scarf. I'll do anything you want. All right. Hope you don't regret saying that. Right after that, a luxury car came to pick us up. We stopped at an apple farm, which was familiar to me as it was where my mom worked. Well, I want to bake an apple pie for my mom. 
so pick me a box of apples. Remember, you have to do it alone. Your friend's out. <laughs> My mom can even pick an average of 12 boxes a day, so one box was just a piece of cake. But who knows her one box was actually a container of 1,000 pounds of apples. Did she want to bake for the whole town? Oh, I'm exhausted. Who on earth could pick apples under this scorching heat for hours? My head started spinning. Losing balance, I fell off the ladder. Luckily, Arthur caught me just in time. Still, your mom does this every day. Can you imagine how hard she works to earn food for the family? Maybe that's why my mom is always tired and cranky. Suddenly, I missed her so much. I finally harvested enough apples and brought them into exchange for the scarf. But Katie still made me choose the ten most perfect apples out of them. No matter which ones I chose, she gave a dissatisfied scowl. This apple is not okay. Neither is this one. It has a two centimeter scratch. You're too much. It's all the same. No way. Everything for my mom must be the best. She's sick and I need a perfect pie for her. Then Katie told me that when her mom was pregnant, she found out she was sick. The doctor advised her to terminate the pregnancy for her safety, but she refused and risked her life to give birth to Katie. Hearing that story, my eyes just naturally welled up with tears. What now? Are you tired from this little bit of work? No, I just miss my mom so much. I really want to get back to her. I realize that even Katie, the heartless, mean girl, still loves her mom this much. Yet, all I do is ask and plead with my mom. I'm such a terrible child. If you love your mom that much, you know what to do from now on. Help me deliver this gift to your heroic mother, will you? And here, take it and complete the mission. Finally, we've arrived. Our final destination is a museum. Arthur said that there will be a secret room with the magic lamp, but getting the key to that room was already a hassle. There were security lasers all over the place, so we broke in through the ventilation system. Arthur tied a rope around my waist and then slowly dropped me down where the key was. Just a little more and... I got it! But as soon as I touched the key, a drop of my sweat fell, causing the alarm to go off. The guards rushed in from the door, but fortunately, Arthur pulled me up in time. We got out of the ventilation system, but this place was like a maze. Then Arthur pulled me to hide behind a wall. Little by little, his face was getting closer and closer to mine, and my heart was pounding like crazy. Suddenly, the whole wall behind me moved. Turns out there was a secret staircase leading down to the basement, and it took us no time to find the room. Huh? Where's the magic lamp? Arthur approached the only object in the room. It's a projector. He turned it on, then on the white wall appeared the image of my mom, being tired after a long day of work. But when she got home, she still came to check if I was sleeping well. The image of her waking up early to make me my favorite breakfast. Above all, she totally knows about the camping trip and is trying to work overtime so I could join it. Time is running out. You should hurry to go back and hand in these items. I tried to regain my composure, quickly wiped away the tears, and left with Arthur. I'll be back with my mom soon. I'm back! Please take me to the gate! Suddenly, a chiming sound got me frozen. I'm sorry, but time's up! You failed the quest. But why worry? It isn't so bad here. You'll have everything you could ever want. At any cost, please lead me to that monster. I don't need anything else. I just want to be with my mom. I've been thoughtless all this time. I can't leave her when she needs me most. Actually, there is no monster here. It is the greed, selfishness, and ingratitude inside of every one of us. But I can see. You already defeated your monster and learned the lesson. So, you can go back to your mom now. Huh? Everything was so bright. Where was I? Honey, you're awake, thank goodness. Someone squeezed my hand. It was Mom. Mom told me how she'd collapsed at work due to overworking. Then she found out I'd fallen off my bike in the snowstorm and knocked myself unconscious. Here you go, sweetie. My mom placed some money in my hand. Now you can go on the camping trip. I'm so sorry for upsetting you. And I promise I will work extra hard so you don't have to go without. I burst into tears and shook my head. I don't need it. I don't want you working overtime and putting your health at risk for me. 
Having you healthy and by my side is all I need. Mom, please forgive me for everything. As we pulled apart, I noticed someone standing in the doorway. Arthur. Turns out, it was Arthur who rescued me in the snowstorm. Thank you so much. You're my knight in shining armor. Anytime. I'm just glad you're okay. I mean it. I wouldn't have completed the tasks without you. Huh? What tasks? Looking into his dreamy eyes, I honestly felt like he'd been sent by my dad to help me learn from my mistakes and be grateful for what I had. <laughs> Never mind. I'm just glad you're here. Hi, I'm Celine, and I've called the St. Augustine Orphanage home since I was six, but I'm not actually an orphan. You see, my parents are special agents with secret identities. Sweetie, if one day someone suspicious asks you about your parents, run for your life. I was used to these fleeting, ghost-like visits from my parents. They often took turns sneaking in and out at night, spending the little time they had with me, and always came together for my birthday. And even though I didn't see them much, they taught me some awesome skills. By the age of 12, I was fluent in five languages, could play a variety of instruments, and do a butterfly kick on anyone who needed it. Despite living a secret life and not seeing my parents as much as I wanted, I still felt lucky that I had them both in my life. It's my 17th birthday, a day I should be super excited about. You see, my parents always visit me together on my birthday, but I've been waiting here for ages and there's no sign of them. This was the first year this had happened. I didn't like it one bit. Something was definitely up. The next day in church, we were singing hymns when I spotted this strange man in the crowd staring at me. My instinct were telling me something was up, so I eavesdropped on him, talking to a nun. That girl with blonde hair. How exactly did her parents pass away? He asked about my parents. That meant my life was in real danger. I fled with all my survival skills right away. What really happened to my parents? Have their identities been revealed? I didn't dare to think about it. So I made sure no one was following me, before going to the subway and looking for a baggage locker. This was where I needed to come in a run-for-my-life situation. I waited until nobody was around before I opened it with my key. Inside was some money, a dossier documenting a girl's life from childhood to old age, and a letter. Our darling Celine, we're very sorry that you didn't have the normal childhood you deserved. Please don't ever doubt that we cherish and love you with all of our hearts. If you're reading this, it means our identities have been compromised. We've included the documents for your new identity. Stay strong. We will reunite soon. You're a loving mom and dad. XO. If my parents could arrange all this for me, I believe that they could handle anything and come back to me soon. So here I am, under my new identity, Diane. Australia, here I come. My parents left me just enough money to start a new life here, pay for rent and tuition fees. How perfectly ordinary. Diane's parents were researchers way in the Arctic. She's from a basic family and attended normal public schools, then worked as an office accountant, did not marry or have children. Everything was boringly safe. The thing is, if I was going to be someone else, then I should at least be someone fun. So I didn't start school. Instead, I created and adopted the identity of 20-year-old Harper and started my first money-making idea, Marriage on Demand. With all I'd learned from my parents, I could make a whole lot of money and at the same time experience how a normal family would look like. Perfect! First, I became a Harvard doctor graduate so this privileged guy's parents would give him his inheritance. Next, a posh aristocrat who saved my client from a dreadful arranged marriage. And then, a sweet-natured girl who helped my client intimidate their seriously mean friends. As soon as my clients achieved their goals, the contract ended and we went our separate ways. Before I knew it, through my Harper alias, I'd married nine guys in just eight months and become eye-wateringly rich. But as it turned out, the cases I took were all abnormal families. This 10th contract would be my final case. Then I'd say goodbye to Harper and attend college as Diane before I lost all faith in ever getting the family of my dreams. But while driving to my rendezvous, I swear that car was following me. It could be my parents or someone dangerous. Only one way to find out. Now I just had to wait. If they were dangerous, I'd drive straight off this cliff, then swim to safety. Then I saw this gormless, grinning guy peer through my window. He held up a temporary girlfriend contract. Hey, I just want to talk. Could he be my 10th client? Either way, he seemed harmless, so I stepped out of the car. I'm Carlton from the courthouse. You've sure been busy, so I've been assigned to investigate you. As far as I'm aware, it's not illegal to marry multiple times, is it? No, only if they're real and not marriage contracts. 
Carlton, I only have one client left and I'm not marrying him. I'm his temporary girlfriend, which I believe is legal. So, is there any chance you could turn a blind eye this one last time? Legal or not, I strongly advise you to quit this job and do something more morally upright. Just then, a black car pulled over and a man walked straight towards us. Oh no, had they found me? I'm sorry for getting you into trouble. I turned around, ready to jump, but Carlton suddenly held my hand back. No need for that. My boss won't eat you alive. Besides, I haven't told anyone about the contracts yet. Oh, so this man's his boss from the court? Turns out he and his wife happened to see Carlton on their way to the airport and just came to say hi. Hey, Carl, it doesn't say much if this girl would rather jump into the sea than date you. He looked really awkward and I felt bad for the guy. Without thinking it through, I clung onto his arm and gave him my best adoring look. Actually, we're deeply in love. I'm an adrenaline junkie, but you know Carl. He's just so strict about things like this. You're right. Carl is rather stiff. If you loosened up a bit, you may have been promoted by now. After they left, I explained to Carlton that's what my job is, helping nice guys out of unnecessary trouble. Nothing immoral about it. I was about to leave when he suddenly stopped me. I could see his attitude changed. Please, make a contract with me. I know you could help me improve my communication skills and get me promoted. You can see how desperate I am right now. I wasn't sure. I mean, number 10 was meant to be my last client, but just look at that clueless face. Fine, but in return, you must be an attentive boyfriend, and I want to have dinner with you and your family every evening. Carl looked a bit confused, but he agreed to my demands. Ugh, this was probably my last chance to experience a family life. I have a strict don't-be-wife-two-people-at-the-same-time rule, so I'm meeting my other client to gently turn him down. Celine, is that you? S celine he knew my name? OMG, that's Matten, the genius pianist from the orphanage. Oh no, this was terrible. He could blow my cover. I, um, I was adopted and go by Harper now. My adoptive parents turned out to be a letdown. I had to fake my identity so I could work on my own. I understand. It's so hard for orphans like us to survive. Yes, it sure is. Look, Matten, things got pretty difficult for me, so I had to take another job in a hurry. I can't do two jobs at once. I'm sorry I have to cancel our contract. Yeah, about that. I already publicly announced I have a girlfriend just a second ago. Pianist prodigy Matten confirmed he's currently dating someone? Matten, I really can't do this. Just tell me who your client is. I can make a deal with him. I can't be with them both, so I called an emergency meeting for them to plead their cases. An article accused me of inappropriate behavior towards female artists. It's completely false, of course. I need a girlfriend to distract the public and make them see I'm not a jerk. I want this promotion. If you won't help me, I'll expose you publicly. Pfft, like that matters. I'll just take you back to the US. No, I can't go back there, and I don't want any attention from people either. This is what I'm going to do, Carl. I'll be your girlfriend on weekdays and do anything I can to help you get promoted. In Matin, I'll be your girlfriend, well, pretend to be your girlfriend on the weekend. But my face has to stay out of the media, okay? Once this is done, then it's goodbye, Harper, and hello, trouble-free, simple Diane. All I have to do is play some music while Matten listens and lets the paparazzi snap photos. I've always admired the way you play music. It follows no rules, but that's what makes it so fearless and fun. His comment made me pine for my parents. They were the reason I played like that. They taught me in the dark, told me to flow with the rhythms without any rules. I miss them so much. I must admit I'd always had a crush on you. When this is over, I want to protect you. I want to be your family. This was sweet, but he didn't know that I already had a family. I just needed to be patient. Then eventually, they'll be back. On weekdays, I joined Carlton for lunch at work and helped him talk to his co-workers and grumpy boss. Then in the evening, I went to his house and gave him tips on how to be more charismatic, make people trust and warm up to him. I also taught him how to walk without slouching and politely greet people. Hi, Mr. Chair. You look great today. Oh, Miss Lamp, are you okay? You shouldn't lose more weight. You're already gorgeous. Isn't that too much? I've never talked like this before. You're doing great. Carlton followed all my advice. He might be a bit clumsy, but in a cute, endearing way. Still, what I anticipated most was joining his family for dinner. I'd never experienced the cozy and warm atmosphere of a family dinner before. Who knew Carl was such a great cook? And so sweet. After only one week, Carl now had friends at work and his boss gave him extra responsibilities. Meanwhile, Matten's reputation also made a rebound thanks to articles like, he doesn't want to be around other girls because he's so passionately in love with this amazing muse.
A frantic week quickly passed, which ended with Carlton's family celebrating his new position, all thanks to me. I was so moved I almost cried, but noticed Carlton seemed off. Maybe he was bummed out as he knew this was the end of our contract. After dinner, we went for a stroll around the garden. Then he blurted out, Who are you really? I was super surprised. Then he told me that one of his new jobs was to investigate a girl called Diane who entered the country, then vanished. I know you're Diane. I can recognize those eyes anywhere. Yes, I'm Diane, but I only faked my identity to earn money. I know you're lying again. It's fine. You've helped me, so I'll help you too. I faked some info to close the case. Thank you, Carl. This means a lot. I knew how important the laws were to him, but he still broke them. For me. I actually quit my job. What do you mean? What about your promotion? You've tried so hard for that. It's okay. I realized I didn't like it so much anyway. I felt terrible that he'd given up his job because of me. But he didn't need me anymore. Our contract had to end, right? Now it's time to end Matten's contract. Then I can go back to being Diane. However, I showed up at the villa to a swarm of reporters. Are you Matten's girlfriend? Please get out of the car. Are you the girl who dates him for dollars, not love? Please show yourself and verify the news. Looks like the news of Matten's girlfriend being a girl who only married for money had leaked. I sat there not knowing what to do. Then I saw Matten coming out of the villa hand in hand with some shiny haired girl. These rumors about my girlfriend are all lies. Amber is a wonderful, kind hearted soul and I couldn't be happier. Oh, I suppose that's pretty smart of him. Finding someone with a nice background was the only way to save his reputation for now. Goodbye, Matten. I wish you well. It seems he couldn't bring himself to ruin his career to protect me the way Carlton did. Now I was free to be Diane and attend this public school my parents wanted me to. Hmm, I was wondering when you'd show up. You're rather popular. A man with a scar has been asking about you. Someone with a scar was looking for Diane? The moment I realized someone was watching me behind the door, my instinct told me to run for my life. I rushed to the window and jumped down, just to catch Carlton peeping at me. What are you doing here? I wanted to see you, so I tracked down Diane. I didn't expect to find you here, but I like you a lot, and there was no time. They saw us together, so I pulled him away. You're driving like crazy, Diane. Who are they? Why are they chasing us? I don't know. All I know is that they're dangerous. He took his phone out to call 911, but I stopped him. No cops. I can't trust anyone but myself, Carl. I'm so sorry for dragging you into this mess. My parents often told me the best way to escape a chase is to jump into the water. However crazy it seems, please trust me. I took a sudden turn and plunged the car straight into the sea. In the water, I unfastened the seatbelt and turned to see Carl already got out of his. He pulled my hand and we swam through the window. The waves drifted us onto a beach, but I had no strength left to move an inch. They're gonna catch us. Celine, sweetie, please wake up. I rubbed my eyes and saw the golden sand, Carlton, and my mom and dad? Am I dead? M mom? No, sweetie, you're very much alive. Turns out the people chasing us were my parents. After 10 years on the job, they finally eliminated the criminal gang and retired. Dad ended up getting the scar, but it's all over now. We could finally be a normal family. You sure made it hard for us to track you down by using a different identity. We should have known our cunning daughter would have created a more challenging life. Like father, like daughter. Huh? You're not Diane? Carlton, my name's Celine. Mom, Dad, this is Carlton, my boyfriend. It was so cute seeing him blush. Then he quickly held his hand out and introduced himself to them. It's lovely to meet you both. I care greatly for your daughter and I always will, no matter how mischievous she is. Turns out it's pretty amazing just being Celine. I started school as myself and so far, so good. I'm living with my kind, talented, and normal parents. We're having the best time together. And I get to date this cute, caring chef. The best part is I can finally stop running for my life and just enjoy the people I love most. Hi, I'm Vicky, the only daughter of a billionaire. Also the sole heir from the third generation of an English aristocracy. Growing up, I was always referred to as Meepo Baby, but this is so unfair. If I had one sentence to sum up my entire life, it would be, well, that didn't go as planned. Before we start, please like and subscribe. I used to live the life of a princess. My house staff was on hand 24 hours to cater to all of my needs. And the biggest decision I had to make each day was to choose which car to go to school in. Still, I wasn't Regina George everyone wanted me to be. I was friendly to everyone and took both my education and my talent seriously. 
From an early age, I found a huge love for painting. You see, my daddy even invited global superstars over just so they could pose for me. Then, it struck me like a bolt of lightning when my daddy got involved in a messy lawsuit and ended up in jail. As a result, we had to kiss goodbye to everything. Yes, the mansion, the staff, but the worst blow was losing Brad, the butler's son, who happened to be my boyfriend. My sweetie pie, I will collect the stars from the skies if it leads me back to you. Well, a girl gotta survive, so I did what I had to. I sold all of my beloved clothes and jewelry, but holy cow, all those Pradas, Gucci's, and Tiffany's still weren't enough to cover a week in a five-star hotel. Hey, use this. Miss, your card has been declined. Clearly you have insufficient funds and therefore must leave. Excuse me? The nerve. The ingratitude. I used to be one of their best customers. It wasn't as if I was the second inventing Anna or anything. So that's how I ended up here, under this bridge full of homeless people, desperately waiting for Brad to come back to me. In the meantime, at least I still had my paintings, which could be my ticket out of here, right? But Jesus, look! Those people kept taking them to smash cockroaches, while others even used them as firewood! Then, one day, as my belly was arguing with me over the lack of food, this charity group showed up. They came to distribute food to the homeless. I scrambled to my feet to ask for some, but was stopped by this woman. Look at your flashy outfit. You can't take food off the needy. How inappropriate. No, no, no. I'm homeless too. Just then, a whiff of the Labo Santal 33 filled the air, and a luxurious lady emerged from the crowd. She waved off the mean woman, then peered at my drawing. Did you paint these? Yes. I've been painting since I was a child. I've painted everyone from Taylor Swift to Ronaldo. Impressive indeed. I'm Diana, a widow of a great fortune. How would you like to come and live with me in exchange for sharing your artistic brilliance in my daily portrait? I was speechless for a few secs, then agreed right away. I was obviously destined to be rich, so it seems I couldn't escape my fate. I arrived at the villa, thinking that this was awesome and I'd finally landed back on my feet. But then... The euphoria was replaced with a gut-wrenching blow when Diana introduced me to her fiancé. Brad? Right after the awkward introduction, I pulled Brad away and confronted him. How could you cheat on me like this? I'll tell Diana. We broke up. Besides, having exes is normal. If you tell Diana I'm your ex, then it's you she'll throw out, not me. I couldn't believe the cheek of this guy. And you know what? We never broke up. I just couldn't spend another moment stuck with this jerk, so I decided to paint Diana a portrait as a thank you and then leave forever. Only, she really loved my painting. Thinking back to those glum days under the bridge, I realized, well, Brad was here, but so was a warm bed, steady meals, and someone who genuinely loved my art. This place was big enough to avoid him anyway, right? So far, so good. Well, until one day. All I did was ask the maid to get me a clean paintbrush when a guy got all grouchy with me. You have legs. Do it yourself. Who are you to talk to me like that? Soon to be the owner of this mansion? Any problem? Leave her alone. It's what the staff are here for anyway. The room suddenly bristled with tension as Brad and that guy exchanged hostile looks. Then he coldly walked away. Suddenly, Brad pulled me out to a corner. Vicky, sorry for hiding it from you, but I have no feelings for Diana. I'm here to spy on her, as she's the reason your father's in jail. I'm here to find evidence and help him regain his honor. Wow! What? I know, it's hard to believe, but I need to cooperate with me. That dude is Charles, Diana's son. He'll try to mess with me by all means, so we need to stop him before he does. It made sense now. I knew Brad loved me really and wouldn't pick some old woman over me. Then he told me his plan. He'd continue seducing Diana and persuade her to get me to tutor Charles while I had to befriend Charles to get information out of him. I felt kind of nervous, but the chance to clear Daddy's name left me with no doubts. However, Charles wasn't the approachable type. He was so curt and rude. And no matter how wide I flashed my friendly smile, I always heard no more than six words from him. Let's do some still life painting today, shall we? You do what you want. I was trying my best to teach him, but he doodled on the page and always came up with the worst drawings I've ever seen. Then one day, he suddenly insisted we go outside for some outdoor portraits, and he to draw me. So my plan did work! Yes! I excitedly stood in the bay window and did an elegant pose. It was sweltering standing there, but I endured it for the art. But it had been four hours and he didn't seem to have finished. 
I couldn't stand any longer, so I rushed to him and dropped my jaw to see what his canvas was. Totally blank! I am furious! <sighs> Calm down, Vicky. Perhaps Charles was like an onion, with multiple layers waiting to be peeled away. So I decided to take a more psychological approach. I asked Diana for Charles's photo book and saw a family photo. This must be Charles's father. I'd paint it, in the hope this thoughtful gesture would move him somehow. On Charles's birthday, I happily gave him the beautifully framed painting. Unexpectedly, upon seeing that, his face darkened, and he had this fiery look in his eyes. He furiously threw the painting to the ground and yelled at me. Disappear! I can't stand you! What the? Fine then! Why is this guy gonna be so rude? I spent all week on that painting. What a psycho! I was packing my bags when Diana came into my room. She explained that the man in the photo wasn't Charles's father, but her ex-boyfriend. Charles's father died when he was little, then her ex was the one who had taken care of Charles since then. To Charles, he was the world. That kid was even closer to him than me. But then we broke up and he vanished without as much as a word. Charles has been hostile and distant ever since. I didn't know behind his rocky exterior was such a bitter truth, so I immediately found him. Charles, I I'm sorry. Go! I might look terrible now, but I was once my father's princess. He gave me everything I could ever ask for, except his time. My parents divorced early, and I was left alone. Just like you, Charles. This loneliness, this yearning for a family bond, I share with you. Seeing his hand loosen, I continued. My intention was never to belittle you. All I wanted was to burst the chasm of misunderstanding between us. Charles still stayed silent, but his facial muscles had relaxed. And when his gaze met mine, he slammed the door shut. So I decided to stay. And even though Charles continued being a grouch towards me, he stopped with the pranks. I also noticed that when Charles focused on something, he turned into a different person. He always stuck his tongue out, which looked adorable. Watching Charles drawing as if he was fighting with the paper, I came here and guided him. But suddenly, our eyes met. He has such dreamy eyes. Oh no, Vicky, less of that. You were here to prove my daddy's innocence and get back to the old life. As for me and Brad, we had to make do with grabbing moments together when we could. When this is over, we can vow to be together forever and have a wedding more lavish than any of the Kardashians. My love, you must be patient. We will be together properly soon. However, when everyone was around, Brad kept up the lovey-dovey pretense with Diana. I knew it was totally fake, but I couldn't help but feel annoyed. I couldn't just sit there smiling like everything was peachy. So, after I finished the painting, I followed Brad, intending to ask him what the next step was after I successfully approached Charles, when I spotted him sneakily talking to someone. Hey, Pop. Yeah, Diana's like putty in my hand. Vicky complicated things, but I came up with a plan to deceive her. I thought that little pest would be long gone by now, but seems Charles hasn't kicked her out. Any ideas? The fury whirled like a tornado inside me. I instantly charged at him and smacked him in the face. What? You? Wait till Diana finds out about this. Oh yeah? If you challenge me, then be prepared to lose. Say hi to your bridge pals for me. I immediately found Diana and exposed all about Brad to her, but her face suddenly turned serious. I knew you'd say anything to divert from the truth, but I know you stole money from me. The maid found it in your room. Stole? What? What are you talking about? Then I looked at Brad and saw him smirking. That conniving mastermind. Before I could try and defend myself, a staff member hurried in and passed Diana a letter. Charles was missing. Everyone was freaking out and refused to hear me out, and the chaos left me powerless as my stuff was dumped outside the villa. I ended up right back where I started and had a complete meltdown. Worst of all, I was worried about Charles. Was he home yet? The next morning, I was trying to sketch something when out of nowhere, Charles appeared. He handed me the keys to this small but cozy apartment and told me it was all mine. Stunned and grateful also. I couldn't stand but hugged him hard. By the way, where did you go? Nowhere special. Felt suffocated, so I left. This time, Charles was like a different person towards me. He visited me every day and even helped me sell my paintings. Over time, my feelings for him grew and we started dating. Our relationship was filled with warmth and affection, and every moment spent together felt like a dream come true. Only... I felt so guilty keeping my dating history with Brad a secret from him, but the fear of losing him loomed over me. 
If he knew I'd approached him with hidden motives at the beginning, he'd despise me forever. But I had to at least tell him something. Be careful around Brad. I don't think he's a good guy. I know. He's a gold digger that's part of a romance scam ring, targeting rich women to blackmail them. Wow. Charles sure knew his stuff. Hang on. Does it mean that Brad intended on blackmailing me, too, when I'd been rich? I'm going to expose him at the wedding ceremony. Come with me. Today is D-Day. The Grand Hall was drowned in the ethereal glow of lights. Standing in the center were Brad and Diana, ready to exchange lifelong vows. All eyes were fixed on them. Out of a sudden, the whole hall went dark, and an anonymous face appeared on the screen behind them. Tonight, we bring the spotlight on our group. Unbeknownst to many, our Brad Thomas is, in reality, Jackson North, born and raised in Pennsylvania by his father, Richie North, the ringleader of scams to trick rich women into marriage and con them out of their fortune. Then the evidence of Brad being affectionate with innocent victims started appearing on the screen. After that, the spotlight immediately stopped on Brad, who was about to flee the scene. Diana roared in anger, rushing there right then, and flung a glass of wine right at his face. The whole crowd started to murmur. Hang on, everyone. The party's not over yet. Check their menus to reveal the other accomplice. Everyone frantically checked, but then looked bewildered to see all the menus were empty. All except for mine, where there was a photo of me and Brad. So since the beginning, Charles already knew about my relationship with Brad? And he thinks I'm Brad's accomplice? I turned to Charles, but he immediately let go of my hand. We're over. This whole time, Charles played me like a hurtful trick, and even thought me capable of something truly awful. I messaged him to meet me by this lake where we used to go. It had been one hour, but he hadn't shown up. This might be the final nail in the coffin of our relationship. Just as I was about to let go, I saw him trudging towards me. Charles, listen to me. I'm not with Brad. I tried warning you about him. I heard the whole sneaky conversation of you two. Your love words and your filthy plan on my family. Then my private detective sent me those photos of you both together that proved me right. You hired someone to spy on me? Not you, Brad. That's why I left home. I thought you were my friend. And I thought we were more than friends. Brad and I did date in the past, but that's all. He tried to use me just like he used others. My feelings for you are real. You have to trust me. So? I didn't know about the scam. I'm sorry I ever fell for Brad's lies and first approached you. He told me your mom was involved with my father's downfall, and I guess I so wanted my daddy to be innocent that I stupidly believed him. Charles didn't utter a word. He just turned around and left. But hang on! May I ask, why didn't you publicize my face in that picture with Brad? I just wanted you to know what it felt like to be hurt, but I couldn't bear to see you hurt either. Let me go. I need some time. Then he left me there, watching him disappear in the dark as the world around me collapsed. After the rain, the sun finally shines again. The police finally caught up with Brad and his dad and locked them both up. Diana tracked me down and apologized to me. She asked me to go back to the villa and paint for her, but I refused. I can't keep on being so trusting and relying on others so much. It's time for me to believe in myself and stand on my own two feet. And more importantly, I couldn't face him anymore. Hi, it's Vicky again, but in a fancier version. After all the sweat and tears, I finally made it as an artist. I was just chosen to collaborate on an important art project with this big company, and my life would turn a new page upon opening this door. Charles! Hi, I'm Aubrey, a super smart girl with an IQ of 200, and you should be ready for my mind-blowing story. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. I grew up in a small village in the countryside where people farm for a living. My family struggled to put food on the table so I could only attend a monastery school. But since childhood, I've always been kind of different. The system is crashing. Please wait for a moment. The chicken is $15.55 minus 15%, cereal is $2.49, potatoes, laundry detergent, so the total comes to $64.85 with the discounts and tax included. Mom soon realized I was a gifted child, so she helped me skip some grades, and by the age of five, I was already doing secondary school math. I always topped my classes, and other students would bribe me with candies to ask for help with their homework. 
At the age of eight, I scored 760 on the SAT math and won the spelling bee competition. I became a phenomenon in the area, and reporters even gave me the Stanford Bennett IQ test, which showed I had the same intelligence as a 22-year and 11-month-old person. My parents were super proud of me, especially my dad. Dad, they all gave me Lego and comics for rewards, as if I was an eight-year-old. Yeah, yeah, they're wrong. You're eight years and five months old already, little lady. He was the only one who could spark interesting conversations with me. That is, until he felt terribly ill. But good surgeons were nowhere to be found in this remote countryside, and we couldn't afford to take him to the center either. We were desperate to see a situation get worse and worse. Then he passed away, leaving us in the depths of despair. Soon after, Mom couldn't afford my school fees anymore, so I had to drop out. Aubrey, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, Mom. There's nothing that school can teach that I can't learn by myself. So she signed me up for a library membership and turned out the best memories I cherished were here, where I could immerse myself in interesting knowledge from all around the world. I was walking down the aisle, absentmindedly running my fingers along the spines of the books, when one caught my eye. And the memories of my dad rushed back to me. If he had been operated on, he'd not have lost. I started turning the first few pages and was captivated immediately. Then suddenly, a fiery desire sparked in my heart. I want to become a surgeon. So I studied every medical book I could find, especially the ones from this author, and decided to save money to enter medical school as soon as possible. To get closer to my dream, I moved out to the city and applied for a job at a coffee shop right next to the medical school. Only... You've broken 10 plates this week already. Are you trying to break a record? Come on, boss. It's just some plates. Not like I burned the whole shop or something. This will be deducted from your salary. Repeat this and you'll be fired. Okay, that's my fault, but I knew he wouldn't fire me. There's no one else who could memorize so many orders all at once. Even Diner Dash Master. Later, I was going to serve a group of students when I heard they were discussing an emergency case. We have to remove that blood clot in segment four of the liver and flush the left lobe. Definitely have to start at the middle hepatic vein. Is this dude serious? Absolutely not. A less intrusive cut would be along the falciform ligament to allow access to segment three. Everyone fell silent and looked at me like I was an alien. Suddenly, the middle-aged man among them stood up. Nice work, young lady. Your method is much more efficient than my student's answer. Which class are you in? Oh, I'm not a medical student but I aspire to be one day. The man asked me to sit down and continued asking me other medical questions, and I answered them all with ease. My adrenaline was rushing. Since my dad passed away, I hadn't had such an interesting discussion. Then, a few days later, the man came back and revealed that he was Dr. Sean Lewis and the principal of the medical school. OMG, you're my favorite author! I admire you so much! Thank you, young lady. Anyway, I came here today with an offer. I was impressed by the knowledge you have in the medical field, and I think you deserve a full expense scholarship to the most prestigious medical school. Can someone pinch me now? This was truly a blessing from heaven that I would definitely not let slip away. Here comes my first day. I went to school extra early to explore as much of the campus as possible. This place was so much bigger and better equipped than my old school. I was looking around the hallway to find my class when someone bumped into me. Oh, isn't it the gave the wrong answer guy at the cafe? He just coldly said sorry and hastily headed to the class over there. 412? It's my class too. I learned that he was Henry, the top student of the class. But obviously he wasn't that good. They'll see. All the theoretical classes didn't make me break a sweat, and I even spotted some mistakes made by the professors. When lunch rolled around, I went to the cafeteria, approaching the first group that caught my eye, and they seemed to be friendly. Want some of my fries? Potato fries contain a high amount of trans fat, which is associated with type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. One day you'll have a stroke, and then you'll know why. Thank me later. They all pouted and left right away. Did I say something wrong? Right then, a nice girl came to me. I'm Laura. Mind if I sit? Sure. Then she told me she was isolated too, just because she wasn't as smart as the other students here. Why are they so mean? Hey, why you gotta be bothered by those toxic people? Do they give you a penny for your thoughts? It's not about how many friends you make. It's about finding one that knows your worth. You're right. I'm Aubrey, by the way. I know, I was in the same class with you this morning. And the way you argue with our professor? Wow, that's impressive. Laura and I quickly became friends. It's great to have her around who could truly see my brilliance and always encouraged me to express myself. Today came a big event. A conference was held by none other than Dr. Lewis. 
But little did I know that this event would become a battleground between Henry and I. Determined to impress Dr. Lewis, I eagerly raised my hand at every opportunity to answer his inquiries. Each time I did, Henry would swiftly raise his hand as well, competing for Dr. Lewis's attention. We argued back and forth, neither backing down until the end of the conference. After that, Dr. Lewis announced that there was one slot available in his upcoming research project, which would go to the top student of this term. The room buzzed with excitement and anticipation. My heart skipped a beat, for working with Dr. Lewis had been a lifelong dream. However, other students started cheering Henry's name. Jeez, I swore I would beat his butt off and show them who deserved it. Time to prove that I was not only unmatched in theory, but also in practice. I was the very first one to finish stitching up the incision. Uh-huh. But as I reached for my gauze, I couldn't find it anywhere. It must be around here, I swear. Oh no, I left it inside the dummy. Okay, this time must be better. How hard could it be to use this defibrillator? But then I accidentally touched the metal pad and got shocked and fell backward. I kept trying in many other practice sessions, but that sucked. Aubrey, this cast looks exactly like a chicken thigh. Do it again. But the most annoying thing was that Henry excelled in all of them and other students started mocking me. After that, I went outside for some fresh air and deep down, I was so disappointed in myself for all my failures. Suddenly, a hand gently patted my shoulder. It was Laura. I couldn't help but hug her and start sobbing. Laura, what if I was wrong about myself? I failed at everything and people started humiliating me. Oh, they just envy you. Nobody can beat your academic scores. That's why they gloated at your failure in practice. But that big brain of yours is what matters the most, right? Yeah? And an opportunity is coming your way. There is an intelligence contest next week. If you win, everyone will have to recognize that you're the best, including Henry. Talk about Laura, my savior. I'll try my best. Just wait and see. A few days later, Laura took me to the library in a private study room. She helped me set up my laptop and left me alone so I could focus. Good luck. I participated in an online oral contest over Skype. There was a panel of judges who asked questions, and all I had to do was answer them verbally. Easy peasy. Now I just need to wait for the results. The next day, I went to school as usual, but then suddenly was called to the principal's office. Dr. Lewis might have known about that competition and saw my name on the top list. I was about to brag about my performance when he accused me of helping other students cheat on their exam. Then he showed me a voice recording of me answering the questions. Wasn't that for the intelligence contest? But Laura said, Dr. Lewis, just wait. I can explain. I frantically called Laura, but she refused to pick up. Enough. I'm so disappointed in you. You're expelled from this moment. Feeling lost and crushed, I trudged myself to a bench in the schoolyard. Hey, are you okay? Okay? You're mocking me? Now that project slot is yours. Happy much? Get out of my sight now! Suddenly a stack of papers fell onto my lap. You might need this. Good luck. I believe you're not a cheater. I confusedly flipped through those papers to see that these were all of Henry's notes from the semester for practice lessons, which could not be found in normal textbooks or lectures. I kept on turning to the last page and saw a scribble. Know your worth. Something awakened inside me, so I swallowed my pride and ran after Henry. Hey, wait! I I've been wrong about you the whole time. I'm sorry. Don't be. It's my fault to act competitively, too. I had no bad intentions. It was just the motivation for me to study harder. I swear. But it's a pity if the medical industry loses someone like you. Um, well, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm used to doing everything so quickly and I can't be patient, which probably explains my clumsiness. That I can help with. Genius is 1% talent and 99% hard work, you know. Since then, I often went to Henry's house to practice. We studied together and he taught me many tips to stay calm, patient, and focused. And turns out, he's also quite the adorable type. Here you go. Thank you, doctor. This is the best stitch I've ever had. One day, I ran into Laura at a gas station. She tried to hide, but I ran straight there to catch her. How could you trick me like that and just disappear like nothing happened? I'm so sorry, Aubrey. I was so blind and just wanted to help those who are bad at studying like me. I never expected it to be that serious and you'd get expelled. And now, why are you here? It's just the medical profession was not my thing, so I quit. But Aubrey, please forgive me. I'm really ashamed of what I did and you were... The only one who had truly been kind to me. 
only when you set things straight and confess everything to Dr. Lewis. But even so, there isn't a likely chance we'll be friends again. So the next day, Henry took Laura and I to see Dr. Lewis. Aubrey? Laura? What are you both doing here? Dr. Lewis, I... I was the one behind the cheating case. Aubrey had no idea and didn't deserve to be punished for my fault. I've been practicing a lot too, sir. Look at these. I've been so careful with every single one. Aubrey has also helped me a lot on our project. I hope you can forgive her and grant her another chance. Dr. Lewis looked quite satisfied, but then he suddenly turned pensive and shook his head. Medical school is not where people can freely join and leave. A doctor needs an extra sharp mind and can be fooled as easily as you were. I'm sorry, Aubrey, but you're not qualified. My heart sinked my toes, and I locked myself inside my apartment for the next couple of days. It wasn't until Henry knocked at my door that I actually went outside. He said he wanted to cheer me up and bring me to his favorite restaurant. I sat down waiting while Henry went to get the drinks. Hey! But a second later, he slipped on the stairs and fell down with a thud with all the broken glass scattering around. It's all right. I, I think I only twisted my ankle. Not a big deal. But my stomach dropped when I noticed a trail of blood on the floor and something protruding from his ankle. A large shard of glass. I swiftly dialed a 911 while Henry winced in pain. Aubrey, you have to administer first aid. Oh, right. I called for the restaurant staff to get the first aid kit, but it was clear that the situation was dire. Henry's face grew pale as blood continued to trickle from the wound. I held the wound closed to stop the blood, but my heart felt weak. I couldn't bear to see him suffer. You trust me, Henry? What do you mean? Y yes? So I immediately pulled out the toolkit that I brought around in my purse. Henry bit down on the tablecloth beside us, and I started the procedure. I maintained a steady stream of chatter, trying to distract him from the pain, but it wasn't helping. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What? Just to distract myself from the pain. Okay, go ahead. Stand a little taller. And done. When I looked up, there was a crowd cheering in awe and admiration. Guys, I caught the whole thing live. The video of the incident quickly went viral. That night, I tossed and turned in bed, unable to contain my excitement. I saved a human life! Reading the comments of the video filled me with a renewed sense of motivation to pursue my dream. The following morning, I was jolted awake by a notification on my phone. It was an email from Dr. Lewis himself. I headed to Dr. Lewis's office, and to my surprise, he told me he saw the video and gently said, Aubrey, I was once like you, arrogant and overly reliant on my natural intelligence. Then, a mistaken surgery left me with regret that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. However, after watching the video, I'm glad that you changed. I saw your humility and eagerness to learn, so I'll give you another chance. So, here I am. You have no idea how much I miss this hallway. Welcome back. How's your ankle doing? Much better, thanks to you. How about a celebration dinner tonight? Sounds great, but promise you won't need me to operate on you again. I was scared to death. Ahead of me still lay a long road, but I believe the day I become a skilled surgeon is closer than ever. And soon I can perform more life-saving surgeries for the less fortunate. Dad. I'm standing in the middle of the room wearing this extravagant dress and a glittery mask. All eyes are on me, but I can sense how ingenuine they are. This is supposed to be my sweet 16th, and yet all of these guests were complete strangers. Ugh, it's all that slimeball Gregory's fault. Actually, this OTT party was all down to him. Oh, hi, I'm Vivian, but my friends call me Viv. My mom, Jacqueline Mars, is one of the wealthiest people on Earth. So, I grew up thinking massive mansions, gigantic pools, and a floor entirely for toys was the norm. Well, at least I did until I turned 10. That day I was playing in my life-size dollhouse when I heard talking coming from the other side of the fence. I peeked over it and saw a woman and a girl around my age who looked kind of weird. Curious, I spoke up. Hey you, why do you dress so funny? Pardon? What did you say? You don't even have shoes on. That's so silly. You're the silly one. Bet you've never tasted this before, huh? So try it. Spoiled rich kids like you always look down on others. Well, in fact, you're no use to society. I just stood there dumbfounded as the security shooed them away. I never meant to offend her. I, I was just curious. So I rushed inside the house to find mom and ask her about this. Oh, honey, not anyone can be as wealthy as we are. That means you don't have to worry about a thing, sweet pea.
Now go play so mommy can work, okay? Even to this day, mom's words still linger in my ears. I've grown to resent my family's wealth. I just wanted to be a normal kid. That's why, by the time I got to middle school, I convinced mom to let me transfer from my private school to a public one and wipe out everything about me online so no one would know about my influential family. I get the bus to school, buy clothes from thrift shops, and prepare my own lunch instead of bringing the gourmet dish the chefs make for me. A perfect normal life. Until Gregory, mom's so-called boyfriend, showed up. He sticks his big nose in everything. Thanks to him, mom wouldn't stop nagging at me about my clothing, my trashy public school, or how I gotta stop hanging out with the mediocre kids. Ugh, he is driving me insane. And to top it off, he gave mom the idea of throwing me a 16th birthday party. I hate attention. Mom knows this. But what Gregory wants, Gregory gets. This could be an opportunity to introduce her to society and gain new associates. It'd be good for her when she takes over business in the future. Blah, blah, blah. Poof. Please. The only thing that man cares about is himself and his associates. Not mine. In the end, I agreed to a masquerade ball. On one condition. Mom has to stop interfering with who I should or shouldn't hang out with. Especially my friends at school. And that brings us to the present. Right when the host announces that it's time for... My first dance? Huh? My what now? Ugh. Gregory! I was confusedly looking around to find a partner when suddenly a hand grabbed me. Birthday girl, come dance with me. Ugh. What a creep. Let go! Can somebody help me with this? Suddenly, a boy around my age appeared. Oh my. He has the most beautiful gray eyes I've ever seen. Excuse me, sir. I believe the lady has agreed to have her first dance with me. Thank you, handsome stranger. As we danced, I couldn't help but stare dreamily into those gorgeous eyes of his. We were about to leave the dance floor when he whispered in my ear, Wait here. I'll be right back. <sighs> Who would have thought a superficial party like this would lead me to my perfect guy? Suddenly, I heard a snapping sound behind me, and as I turned around, my mask fell off. Oh no, a paparazzi cut my mask string. I tried to cover my face with my hands, but it was no use. Luckily, Mum rushed over and hid me behind her. Sorry, everyone, but the party's over. We had a great time and hope to see you all again soon. Then she led me back to my room while the security showed everyone the way out. From that moment on, my ordinary life ended for good. My face was plastered all over the internet as the billionaire Jacqueline Mars' daughter. Now everyone at school is looking at me funny. I don't get it, guys. I'm still the same old Viv. Oh, there my besties are. They would surely have my back, right? But nope. As I approached them, they went ballistic on me saying how I don't trust them enough to confess about my actual background, so from now on we're no longer friends. This is so unfair. I never asked for any of this. I wipe away my tears, trying to act like nothing happened. Huh? What's this? There's a note lying on top of my books that says, Hey, it's me, the guy from your birthday party. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. If you need anyone to talk to, text me any time. Oh, so he's from our school? Wow. Just when I thought no one's there for me, he showed up again. But there's no name, though. Is he still playing this mysterious game? Okay, I'll just call him my mask tonight, then. From that day on, we texted nonstop. He just gets me. My family situation, my friends, everything. One time, he even secretly slid a black-pink concert ticket in my bag since I once told them that I was their diehard fan. Another time, he sent me a gift card to my all-time favorite ice cream store, Ben & Jerry's, just to cheer me up on a bad day. Aww. This ice cream tastes delicious, but I can't help wishing the masked knight was here with me. All I know is he has the most beautiful gray eyes and gorgeous black hair. Hmm. Oh, speak of the devil. Hey, I have a surprise for you this Valentine's Day. Hope you're as excited to see me as I am to see you. Finally, I get to meet the boy I'm crazy about. I can't wait. On Valentine's Day, I was in English staring out of the window and thinking about my masked knight. I wonder what he looks like. Ladies, I brought your Valentine's roses. Here you go, Viv. 
This is it. It's gotta be from him. Happy Valentine's Day. Have a taste of the rose, then come meet me at the pool. X. I quickly unwrapped the candy, popped it into my mouth, then rushed to meet my dream man. Well, where was he? As I tried calling him, the room started to spin. I saw the outline of a blurred black figure, then... Ugh. My head is killing me. Where am I? And whose hand am I holding? Hold on. Those eyes. He must be. Thank goodness you're awake. Uh, are you the one who danced with you at your birthday party? In the flesh. I'm Jeremiah, by the way. I had higher hopes for our first face-to-face -face meeting, but oh well. <laughs> Turns out, he always knew I went to the same school as him, but he was a bit intimidated by my family's influence, so he decided to get to know me via text first. He said the cops had found some sort of sleep-inducing substance in my rose candy. Before I could quiz him anymore on this, Mom barged into the room and hugged me. After making sure I was okay, she turned to Jeremiah and said, You saved my daughter. For that, I can never thank you enough. Please join us for dinner tomorrow night. Jeremiah seemed hesitant at first, but then he nodded in agreement. Hmm. The dinner did not go as planned. Between Mom's blatant interrogating and Gregory's menacing looks, I could sense Jeremiah's discomfort. Then when Jeremiah asked where the restroom was, Gregory insisted on showing him. When Jeremiah returned, he seemed flustered and made his excuses to leave. Gah. What had that annoying Gregory said to him? I quickly followed Jeremiah and apologized, but he just smiled and offered to pick me up for school tomorrow. The cops haven't found the culprit yet, so from now on, I'll be your guardian. How sweet. After that, I hung out with him every day. Great, right? Only, somehow it didn't feel the same as when we were texting. Back then we had a deep connection. Now it was just like two friends hanging out. Oh, and not to mention Olivia, Jer's childhood friend who can't seem to leave him alone for more than two seconds. One time, Jer and I were at the movies together, but guess who coincidentally appeared and plonked herself down next to him? Yep, Olivia. Worse still, with their giggling and popcorn sharing, I felt like the third wheel. I was not having this again, so I just left for home in this random cab parked outside the theater. But bad luck. The driver doesn't know the way. He doesn't even have a phone. And I had to lend him mine for GPS. The guy snatched it out of my hand immediately. Rude. But wait, it was 9pm already. Why did he still have shades on? And even wore a mask? Right then, I realized the car had passed the town's border. Stop! The car suddenly filled with smoke. And the last thing I thought was, he has eyes that were exactly like... Jairs. I woke up finding myself in this old, cobwebby room. Where is this place? And that driver guy. I have to get out of here now. <clears throat> <sighs> right at that moment, he came into the room with a smile. Don't you recognize me? Will you have another dance with me? Because I'd love that. What is happening right now? What he just said. Did that mean... He's the actual masked knight? Maybe that's why I don't feel connected to Jeremiah. Why did Cher lie to me then? So many questions popped up in my head. Then suddenly I heard a car stop outside. That guy immediately went to check. This could be my chance of escaping. By the time I got downstairs, I saw the driver guy talking to... Jeremiah. So I hid behind the door and watched on. Cameron, just stop this. Getting revenge on our father is one thing but this is a step too far. Take Viv back to her family now and end this. I know this looks bad, but trust me, I'd never hurt Viv. I didn't mean for her to fall into the pool. That's why I jumped in to save her. But I need her as bait to show the world what that jerk Gregory is like. He doesn't deserve to be her father. <gasps> I muzzled myself in shock. Gregory is their father? And that Cameron guy was the one saving me. Not Jer? Don't you forget who abandoned us when mom had a close brush with death, then took all our business and properties, even our home, leaving us helpless? That jerk deserves all he gets. I was trying to process it all when another car arrived. 
Gregory's. I quickly hid under the stairs before he walked in with a bunch of bodyguards. Cameron, Jeremiah, my sons, haven't you grown up so fast? Cut to the chase. Give us back the business and what's rightfully ours. Then we'll let your stepdaughter go. Huh, <laughs> indeed. Like father, like sons. Very smart. But still amateurs, my boys. You see, all that girl is to me is an obstacle blocking my way to the inheritance. So please, be my guest and take care of that little Miss Annoying. Aren't you afraid we'll expose everything you just said? And who's gonna believe you now? Jacqueline is mesmerized by me, so she'd believe anything I say. <laughs> that snake. How dare he speak of my mom like that? Unable to hold in my rage, I jumped out of my hiding spot and screamed at Gregory. What did you say about my mom? You slimy, lying traitor. Nice talking to you all, but the fun has to end here. Goodbye. The guards lunged forward, about to tie me up when... The cops smashed the door coming in, and behind them was... Mom! Stop right there. How dare you do this to my daughter! Gregory's face turned paler than a ghost as he mumbled out, Jackie, honey, why you're here? Um, but just in time to save our baby, Vivian. Cut the act. I already heard everything you said. And you're going to jail for a long time. Then the cops led him and took his crook guards away. Seeing Mum, I was so happy I rushed to hug her. Turns out, her investigations of the pool incident led her to Cameron. So when she confronted him, he eventually told her everything. That's how they came up with a plan to catch Gregory red-handed. Mum and the cops had been waiting in ambush around here for Gregory to show up. Then, well, you know the rest. A lot has happened in three months. Mum finally finished all the legal stuff, so now the property Gregory had merged with hers to gain her trust is now signed back over to Cam and Jeremiah. I realized that being wealthy isn't a bad thing, especially as it means with influence like this, I can help other less fortunate people and really make a difference. Now I help mom with her business and her charity work, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm proud of my hard-working, amazing mom, and I'm proud of who I am. And guess what? I now have real friends who like me for me. As for Jeremiah, well, he apologized about everything. He used to fear his brother was going to hurt me, so he lied to protect me. We made up, of course, and became the best of friends. I'm not sure I can say the same about his brother, though. He did everything he could to beg for my forgiveness, but I just can't. Then one day, Jer asked me to come by his home to visit his mom. She begged me not to think badly of her boys, especially Cameron. He's in love with you, you know? He always talks about you and how he wishes things would have been different. Oh boy, her words are starting to have an effect on me. When I walked out the door... I saw Cameron sitting on the porch. He turned and looked at me, and I felt my heart pound for my gray-eyed, masked night. So, taking a deep breath, I walked over to him, just as the sun was setting. Annyeonghaseyo! I'm Minzi from Seoul. Do you believe conspiracy theories are real? Because I do. Before I tell you my paranormal story, please like and subscribe. Nothing much to say about myself. I'm timid, introverted, but above all, I have a big ambition to webtoon horror category. Ahem! It's one of a kind, right? I've spent sleepless nights on that. Go kneel in the hallway for 30 minutes. Now! Aw, oh, man. Creepy Mincy is at it again. She wants to haunt the whole class with those ugly doodles or something? Ugly? Well, not as ugly as your... your grandmother. The whole class gasped at my insensitive words. But it's that girl. Supin's fault first. No matter how invested I was into my draft, it only ended up another chance for Supin and her posse to laugh at me. And well, thanks to my poor communication skills, no one wants to be my friend. Well, except Hajun, my childhood friend. He's always been so nice to me. Not to mention he's handsome, friendly, and smart. You could tell I had a crush on him, right? But of course, I have no guts to tell him. <sighs> One day I was riding my bike around when I suddenly saw flyers from Blackwood Publishing, the biggest publisher on Webtoon. They're looking for a comic collaborator. Oh, wow. I could send mine to them. But would I stand a chance? I bet the candidates are way more talented than me. 
As I guess I better stop dreaming, just then a skater kid dashed towards me. I managed to dodge him, but ended up crashing onto the pavement fence. I felt myself flip through the air, and then everything went black. When I opened my eyes, I found myself on the hospital bed. Mom and Dad were beside me. They looked like they couldn't believe it, then burst into tears? Mincy, honey, you're finally awake! Thank God, you've been in a coma for the whole month. We were worried sick. Hold on a sec. A whole month in a coma? Was I that seriously injured? It took me a few days to recover and process all of this before going back to school. Bet these kids didn't even notice I was missing class for a month, though. But suddenly, someone sprung on my back. Supin? Oh, here you are, Urichingu! Let's go shopping today! The dress you picked me last time was perfect for my date! W what dress? Am I friends with these mean girls now? And not just them. Everyone else seemed to be friendly to me all of a sudden. They gave me cookies, carried my food tray, and even lent me their notebooks. It's weird, but kind of nice, though. <laughs> Except the only person I cared about just straight up ignored me. Hey, Hajun, wait up. Are you all right? I'm fine. It's none of your concern anyway. Oh, I just want to check in on you. <sighs> Could today get any weirder? Yes, it did. When I came home, I suddenly received an email from Blackwood Publishing. Congratulations! Your digital comic is now officially published on our website. To celebrate your success, please come to our office tomorrow. Huh? Is this a prank? I quickly checked, and it's not. My comics were literally on the headliner. But how? I mustered all the courage and went to the publisher. One step in, and I was overwhelmed by all the facilities. It was all so new to me. But just then, a group of people flocked around me and babbled to me nonstop, like they'd known me before. Yeah, our faith boy group BOF, Boys Over Flowers, is holding a concert tonight. Those opas make my emo heartbeat like crazy. Hey, you should come with us. It's going to be so much fun. Eek! Oh, but didn't those boys only lip sync and dance half-heartedly? I even heard people say it's a waste of money going to their concert. Guys, did I say something wrong? Suddenly, I got this chill down my spine. Someone's hands were crawling around my waist. My boo-boo's here. Ah, pervert! I turned around and slapped him in the face. Oh, why did you do that? It's me who should ask this. Why did you touch me? Are you serious? Wait, are you still sulking with me? What? I'm sorry, okay? Now your boyfriend's ready for some snuggles. Boyfriend? Last time I checked, I still had the biggest crush on Hajun. How did I settle for this dandy? The guy was extremely clingy. He wouldn't leave me alone for a sec. Um, don't you have any work to do? Work? I am. I'm tending to the artwork of my life. You! <laughs> uh, sure. He also kept insisting on seeing my webtoon draft to help me polish it. Help my butt? He only messed it all up. Not to mention, everything is completely new to me, but everyone acted like I'm so used to all of this. This didn't feel right. Later the day I told my parents about this, and they said the doctor did mention possible memory loss due to brain injury. Hmm, makes sense. But why did they seem all anxious? Over the next few days, I tried to cope with my new life, even though it didn't make any sense at all. Like, I now had my favorite seat in the canteen. You nerds are sitting on Minzy's spot. Move! And apparently, I got a new hobby of skipping school now. What's the matter? You've done this so many times before. <laughs> Why did I even do this? Hajun, on the other hand, still kept distance from me. Until today, we had a project discussion. I tried to break the ice, but he only replied coldly. Why are you here? This whole month you've ditched me to hang out with your hot friends. And now you suddenly want to talk to me again? The, the whole month? What do you mean? You suddenly turned 180 degrees and became this attention seeker. You even pulled stupid pranks on those mean girls and got them to worship you as their leader. B but I was in a coma the whole month. <laughs> You're kidding, right? No. Why would I joke about something like that? Then who was the Mincy I saw every day at school the past month? Was he saying I was in two places at once? How was that possible? Hajun came up with a bunch of conspiracy theories, then concluded that I had an imposter, and she had been replacing me while I was in the hospital. It made perfect sense, but so bizarre at the same time. Seeing how freaked out I was, Hajun gently comforted me, saying he'd help me figure this out. I knew it. He still cared about me deep down. While we were discussing, Supin and her clique came interrupting us. Hey, Mincy! What are you doing with this geek? Remember our group meetup today with the Ansan Highs boys? Meet up? Uh, no, I don't think I can- Of course she remembers. Can I come too? I'll keep my mouth zipped. Fine, now hurry up! Psst, 
What are you up to? Your imposters must have known about this meetup, so she might be there. This is our chance to catch her. Except the imposter was nowhere to be found, while well, I was stuck with these self-obsessed dudes. Where's your sass, Mincy? Introduce yourself. Oh, um, hi. Uh, I'm Mincy. You can call me Sugar Mincy, because I'm sweet as pie and you sure want to take a, a bite. The whole room was dead silence. <laughs> Girl, you got no riz. Wonder why you can't date anyone. Everyone was laughing at my face. Luckily, Hajun grabbed my hand and took me out of there. Here's much better. But I couldn't help but thinking how my life had turned upside down because of that imposter. You all right? You don't have to force yourself into a mold that isn't for you. You're special for who you are. And I prefer this you rather than that imposter. I could feel something churning in my stomach. I'm so glad I always have him by my side. The next morning, Su Pin and her clique suddenly came to apologize for laughing at me. But why? Uh, didn't you come back last night and snapped at us? Told us to publicly apologize to you today? I did? So the copycat did come to the karaoke. Did she intentionally stalk me? Later that day, I went to tell Hajun about this. But why did she have to do that? I mean, she tried to stand up for you, right? I don't know. It must be part of her scheme or something. I have to find her ASAP. Suddenly, I got the notification of the Mean Girls live streaming at a cafe. Wow, guess who it is, guys? Oh, our little rich lady is a waitress. And she dared to look down on us all the time. She steered her cam towards the poor girl they were talking about. And she looked exactly like me. It's her! Hajun and I immediately rushed to the cafe and saw Su Pin and the imposter was about to jump at each other. What's going on here? Mincy? Wh what? Why are there two Mincy's? It's a g g g ghost Guys, run! You! Who are you? And why did you pretend to be me, you imposter? Mincy, finally we meet. I'm your twin sister. Minha! Sister? We're related? But mom and dad never told me I had a long-lost sister. Because you're adopted. They didn't know you had a twin sister who just got adopted before you. You're lying. I'm not. I didn't know this either until my mom was in her final moments. Mom had been sick for a while, so one day she called me to her bed, told me the truth before she drew her last breath. After that, I came to find you, but you were already in the hospital by then. You did wake up after surgery, but once you saw me, you immediately had a seizure and fell back into a coma again. Your parents and I agreed it was best for you if I stayed away and waited until you fully recovered. Meanwhile, you decided to live my life for me? Believe it or not, I actually wanted to know what my long-lost twin sister's like, how she's doing. Turns out you're a very talented comic artist, but you're always so insecure. And you're not doing well with the kids at school either. So I wanted to help you out. Sending your webtoon draft, working at the publisher, and fixing those mean girls' wagons. I just went with it and ended up getting too wrapped up. Really, did you get wrapped up in dating a random guy under my name too? And what about school? Did my parents agree to let you replace me? It was my idea and I persuaded them. They're just worried about you. I didn't ask for any of these in the first place. Thanks to you, I've become a stranger to my own life. You're happy now? Then I ran away, never wanting to see her again. Still, the worst part was, my parents lied to me. Why did you do it? You didn't tell me I'm adopted, and now you let a stranger replace me? Do you really see me as your child? Minty, honey, of course you're our daughter. Nothing could ever change that. We were afraid you'd be sad if you knew you were adopted. Truthfully, we love you more than you can ever imagine. It's a lot to process, but I had to be strong and stay focused. But soon, whisperings caught my ears. Did you notice Mincy recently is different and even a little bit dull? Where's the cheeky Mincy we're used to? Hey, do you get that bad vibe from Mincy lately? Somehow she'd gone back to being a sullen, creepy nerd again. God, why did everyone keep comparing me to that imposter? Hey, you all right? No, I'm not. Everyone seemed to like Minha and she'd only been here for a month. But nobody cared about me. I do care about you. You always got me. Your handsome friend, ready to the rescue. <laughs> Whatever you say. Come to think of it, your sister only meant well. Despite her way, all she wants is to help you to be more open and show your hidden talents to the world. What Hajun said got me thinking that night. Maybe he's right. If it hadn't been for her, my webtoon would have been forever locked in my iPad. Besides, she's only got me as a family. I've got to see her now. Hey, I came to apologize. I could see you only meant well. And I was only acting ungrateful. I'm sorry. And also, 
Thank you, Uni. There's nothing to be sorry about. It's my fault too for acting on my own and getting myself to fall in love with Si Wu. I haven't told him yet, but I will find the chance. Sorry for dragging you into my stuff. I leapt into her embrace and felt the happy tears running down my cheeks. After the teary reunion, we spend hours catching up with each other. It's like we're reading each other's minds. Must be the twin bond. <laughs> I even invited her to my house and we had a good time. For the next couple days, I only focused on the webtoon and getting to know myself better. With Ha Jun's help, I now felt more comfortable and confident speaking with others. One day at the publisher, while I was having a little chit-chat break, a colleague rushed in. Minzi, Minzi, did you hear the news? Your webtoon won the first prize of comic award. Comic? The most renowned award in webtoon? Oh my god, I'm dreaming, right? My hard work finally bore fruits. I was celebrating with my colleague when out of nowhere, Si Wu dragged me out. You better announce me as the co-author. I helped you with the sketches, the script, the coloring, yada yada yada, remember? What? You were only messing it up. Do you even know what the story is about? Babe, don't challenge me. Or else, I would tell the director, aka my dad, to kick you out. And by the way, let's break up. Excuse me? You really think I like you? Oh, please. I only do it for your webtoon, babe. Ugh, that dandy jerk. I knew he was no good. But what could I do now? Later, I told Minha everything, and she was heartbroken and begged me to help her sneak into Siwoo's office. So I did. Siwoo, please don't leave me. How could I live without you? Oh, it'll be hard, because I'm irresistible. <laughs> but you gotta let go, babe. You have nothing else to offer me. I already know you don't love me, but I do love you. And I already put a love spell on you. You'll forever be haunted by me. <laughs> Then, Minha fainted, crashed on the floor. Scaredy cat Siwu was freaking out. Hey, hey, you're not gone, right? Suddenly, the light turned off. What in the Holy Spirit's going on? The light turned on again, and the guy stopped screaming until he saw me. Hi, babe. Ah, what, why are, what are you? You don't recognize me. It's me. Minji, in spirit form. Stay the heck away from me. After every despicable thing you've done to me. Please, please. Come with me, you crooked. To, to, where? To the other side. He was so scared his eyes went white. Then he fainted. <laughs> Serves you right. And let me introduce my Ekip with Minha, who should win Oscars for that performance, and Hajun, who's behind the light effect. Didn't think of that, did you? After that, Siwu kept insisting I was some spiritual force that haunted this place. Then eventually, he quit the job. And of course, I had the full copyright of my webtoon and was eligible to receive the comic award. My career has just begun as I decided to continue to work at Blackwood. Mom and Dad also decided to adopt Minha into our family, and we could finally be together. That's the magic I wanted to tell you. This unexpected event changed my life for the better. Chance doesn't come twice, right? You have to grasp it. By the way, I want to ask, do you guys have any unexpected events that changed your entire life? Tell us in the comments below. Hang on, here's one more thing I have to do for the old shy me. Hajun, uh, I've been wanting to tell you something. The past event got me thinking, if I don't start telling you how I feel now, I might regret it later. So, Kim Hajun, I like you. So, so much. Finally, it took you that long. When you were in hospital, you weren't the Minzi I knew, which freaked me out thinking what if I couldn't see the real you anymore. It's comforting that you're still here, because I got a huge crush on you too. 